And for this reason, I think that uh, the wheel project uh, is uh, a, a very, very innovative uh, 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 solution just because uh, to involve in the meantime a very important company like a private company uh, like Economic Group of this, a public company like uh, uh, a Peshan, an international company. Uh, 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 like a higher expert uh, in world that and then in the, in the meantime it involved uh, uh, 10 startups coming from uh, uh, several countries like uh, uh, South Africa, uh, Canada, UK, uh, Germany, Netherlands, this is anyway is uh, fantastic, fantastic, especially for an innovative contamination hub uh, as we are. Just uh, our main purpose is uh, just to get uh, to, to to collect, uh, to, to make uh, speak uh, all the people, the, the, all the people, and uh, to collect the different uh, different uh, thoughts, uh, to 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 collect uh, different ideas, and uh, this is uh, just our purpose. The purpose is, uh, I think, to put together. Uh, in, 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 
just in order not to have the possibility to share our our experience, our thoughts, our knowledge. And uh, well, this project has been so fantastic, and the success has been uh, so so good that to, we are just thinking how to continue, how to repeat this experience. Surely in the world that field and if it's possible also in the other different uh, fields and other different methods. And um, just in order to confirm that the open innovation is today the absolutely the new solution. It's also for the big companies because uh, as I say, the, 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 the world is so complex that uh, also for a big company is uh, this means uh, not to, to, to think a new, a new way how to manage a, 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 the research and development uh, activities. And the open innovation is absolutely the, the only way. It's not only a new way. I think that there is a unique uh, solution to this complexity. And the, to create this condition is our main task. This means that our idea is to repeat, to clone this formula, the formula of the will, just as I said, in other different, in other different applications, in other different tools. This means that, again, many thanks to everybody, many thanks to the, all the startups that are trusted in us and uh, 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 they have spent the time with us, and I, I think that they have received also uh, um, uh, an added value from this uh, collaboration. And uh, good work to everybody, and thanks again. Thank you very much, Ricardo, for introducing us and hosting us here today. And now I will hand the word to Chris Thomas, Head of Innovation at Iowa Utilities, to just explain a little bit more about the program and uh, where we are now. Thank you. It's great to be here today. Thank you very much for hosting us in CSMT. Your, your offices are, are beautiful. They're newly renovated. Um, my only complaint is that for those who are joining online, the webcam is, is, is high up in the, uh, the sky there. So um, for folks like me, everybody gets a slight view of how my hair is beginning to fit. So, um, <laughs> apologies to you online. And thank you for joining. After me. Always is better. I won't speak for long because today is a celebration and it's a celebration of the innovations that the startup, as part of Will, uh, are bringing to the water sector. So they are the people we want to hear from. So I will just say a few words, but just to explain the origins of Will, what it is, uh, and uh, how we've got to today uh, for a moment. So Will, the Water Innovation Living Lab, is an accelerator. Uh, if you've not come across accelerators before, they are the creation of an environment for startups to try and help their growth and to speed up their growth, to accelerate it. Uh, and they come in all shapes and sizes. They come in all shapes and sizes, but what makes Will unique, and what we're really proud of, is the collaboration that has made it happen. Um, so you can see all the logos on the, uh, on the side of the slide there. Um, and what's lovely about this collaboration is that we have the whole chain of events uh, that an innovation will go through. We have the local university, where ideas are born, we have the, the Ideas Hub of CSMT to help foster that. We have Bologna as the supply chain, bringing innovations into the sector. And we have Acrobrosciani as the end customer and user. So between us as a group, we like to think that we've probably got somebody who can speak to the startup situation, no matter where they are on their journey through, through that whole experience. And speaking of journeys, the Will journey began almost a year ago uh, when the collaboration came together to frame up the challenges within the industry that it wanted to solve. Uh, we won't go into them today because actually as a big group we came up with quite a lot of challenges. So if you have a solution for the water industry, we've probably had a challenge for you. Um, 
but we began promoting them way back last year um, from May. Uh, and there was a lot of interest in Will generated as, as a result. A lot of people applied to be part of the team. So anybody who is part of Will can already be part of having been selected because there were many more applications than we had played before. Um, and all those smiling faces you can see there are from the 10 startups um, who joined us as part of the cohort um, this year. And we started working together from January. Um, and by working together, we've been doing three things. We've been training, coaching, and connecting. So every Friday, you can see a picture there, we would meet in the afternoon and we would go through um, different topics that we hope would help the startups in their journey uh, developing in their maturity. We would also be uh, coaches. So um, we would hope to answer the specific questions that all the startups would have. Um, and as I said earlier, we like to think that we've probably got somebody who could answer those questions within the broad collaboration that is real. So we've been coaching them on, on the specific questions they have, and we've been trying to help connect them with industry through events like this, where they get to present to uh, the lovely audience we have here today, uh, through events we have run previously, um, and to many more that are coming in the future. We have one in Italy, Acaduio, have I pronounced that right? Yeah. Yes, 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 in October, um, which we can look forward to as, as, as one of many other events that they are, have all been invited to be uh, part of as a chance to connect with yourselves and share their innovations with you. And as we've heard, it's a very, very diverse uh, group. Globally, we're, we're spread all over. We didn't have a dot for Australia, but William, who's with us today, has indeed travelled all the way from Australia to join us. So this is a real global perspective on the innovation that is coming towards the water sector. And you can see from the company logos there, we've got solutions in water treatment, in wastewater treatment, in networks, and in digital. So there should be something for everybody, depending on what your, your area is. Uh, but what I really love about this, and what I get very excited about, is that this, this group is a diverse global group covering lots of disciplines, really represent a snapshot of the innovation we can look forward to as an industry of what's coming forward uh, in the pipeline for the sector. So I hope, I hope today is going to be really exciting and interesting for you as you get to hear and get a good view of that, that pipeline that is coming towards us. I'll stop there and hand over to Antonia to kick us off with the real work of the day. Thank you first for the introduction. Okay, so now we will go to the startup pitches. So these are the first five startups that we'll present today. Alton Technologies, Seawater Technologies that is here in the room with us, Hydrodrip, Parto, and Net Zero. So we will ask you, because we will have at the end an award for, from the audience, to please scan the code or go to menti.com and put in the code that you see there, 89784776. And please vote. So the first question is something like, why are you here today? So hopefully to learn something and uh, to just meet new people. Um, and then there will be one slide like this on the right, where you have the name of the technologies and you can just vote. Please just vote at the end after you heard all five of the technologies because you can only submit one vote. We will remind you after that. And as I said, you will give uh, an award. So first up presenting is Alton Technologies. So they have an advanced treatment process for disinfection and recovery of, um, of coagulants and improved metal removal. So Pamela, are you there? I'm here. Yes, perfect. Okay, okay. so I will you. interrupt sharing my screen and leave you the... Okay. Uh, <laughs> I'm losing the mouse here, but ta, ta, ta. okay, go ahead. <laughs> Am I with you there? Yes, you can please share your screen so that. Okay, I did that, but it... share. Is it sharing? Not 
quite yet. Okay. Now? Yes, it is coming up. Perfect. Floor is yours. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you, Will and the Will team, for this tremendous opportunity to be able to present to you. Today, I'm going to be talking about olden technologies and a, a, a technology that we have developed called Maxidox 5. Now, Maxidox 5 is a sustainable, synergistically advanced water treatment process consisting of electronics and electrode cells. And having been in the water industry for many years, we know the pressure on water engineers to meet compliance. We help the water engineers meet this compliance with water quality compliance by the degree of the removal of contaminants and then the environmental compliance by the process that we have and the rate of the removal of contaminants. In the old days, a computer filled a room of 170 square meters and then came a chip. We now have a small laptop with infinitely more powerful. Now, MAX5 is a game-changing chip in the water treatment. We can hugely increase the through flow with an exceptional improvement in water quality. So our solution is a robust full flow through modular device that is optimizing water treatment systems. It does improve the rate and degree of the removal of the organic and the dissolved and the suspended contaminants. It also disinfects at the same time without chemicals. And this it does by using negligible power and the treatment is not stuck in a batch flow phases. It's a full, full, throw, full flow through process. And the technology is a synergistic process of electrochemistry, electromagnetism and ultrasound, which we commonly call electrokinetic disruption. Uh, each electric pulse creates hydroxyl radicals and oxidant species. Uh, the ultrasound enhances the effects, even at very high flow rates, and the particles and the molecules that are, are affected at least 2,000 times as the water flows through the reactor cells. I could tell you that MAX could possibly help remove PFAS and PFOS, but instead here are some of the common persistent problems that frustrate water engineers globally that MAX has successfully treated. They are disinfecting for the large range of microbes and coliforms, iron, manganese, aluminium, turbidity and color, ammonia and nitrite, as well as organic compounds, cyanide and arsenic, oil and grease, and many more chemicals of concern. How does Max solution help you to meet compliance? Well, it, it disinfects water without the necessity to add chemicals. We enhance flocculation and coagulation and we improve the removal of solids and organic compounds. Um, the result of this is that we provide a very good water treatment system with reduced capex and opex. This is simple to operate and manage and it produces an exceptionally good quality of water safely and sustainably. How do we know this? Well, we did it. The first time ever in the history of the plant, we were able to give the compliance for a final water quality at double the plant flow through. This is an example where we used to increase the plant capacity from 3,000 to 6,000 cubic meters per day with a very small environmental impact. There was a little environmental impact. There was a reduced sludge volume. We met demand. We upgraded the, the outdated plant and it took less time than it would have taken the engineers to actually design a new plant. So the client was extremely happy because they would be able to be earning revenue um, in a very short time. Now, the type of results that we were able to get from this was that we improved treatment in color, iron, aluminum, turbidity, and we had reduced DVPs. Now, if I look at the, the results of this, we had the original plant in May, which was before the rains, and the maximum results and best results they were obtained were to give at a final throw flu, uh, through flow of 72 and 
they were able to get some sort of results, but not really as they would have liked it. And if you have a look, they did have THMs um, that were greatly increased because of the use of chlorine. Um, also, when we put the pilot in, we were able to achieve double the, the plant, um, excuse me, through flow, and we were able to achieve exceptional results. And without using chemicals, of course, we could actually um, achieve this with very low DPBs. Now, mass can also be used in a wastewater effluent solution. We can use it after the pH correction and after flocculent dosing. And then we would put it again at the end of the plant so that we would be able to disinfect as the water went out for reuse. It behaves very well in a competitive environment because we can improve or totally replace many of the processes currently used. For example, electrochemistry, advanced oxidation processes or disinfection. Other treatment types that Max will definitely make an, Im, um, an improved impact on is filtration, adsorbance, flocculation and coagulation, and settling. So how much does it cost? Well, the cost of a, tri a trial plant to treat 170 cubic meters was 78,000 euros. And the disinfection comparison, if we looked at the electricity, we were able to use 0.024 kilowatt hours per kiloliter. Um, we expect a life expectancy of approximately three years to seven years. And for disinfection, there are no chemicals required. For other chemical usage, flocculant and lime, we were able to make an improvement and reduce the chemical usage by up to 77%. The financial benefit is not only just on the re reduction of chemicals, but a huge reduction on the capex as well. Because if we look at the cost of max, um, taking a range of plants, we were able to then compare that with what it would cost if we were using a normal plant build and the cost gain or the capital gain was arranged from 33% to 60% that the customer would actually be saving in their capex. So we are looking for business partners and for fundings for our startups. We have a plan to have a footprint in Italy by the end of the year with compliance in at least two countries in Europe. So if you would like to join us um, and join in Maxidox's story, please email an expression of interest to us at pamela.audemtech.com. And thank you, Will, once again, for this incredible opportunity to present to you. Thank you very much, Mela. That was amazing. So now we'll open the door to your questions. Uh, anyone in the audience here or online, do you have any questions you want to ask Mela and Tori? Go ahead. <laughs> Um, maybe can we give him a microphone? Thanks, Chris. Question in a second. Are you in? Come on. Please just say your name uh, so that uh, Amela recognizes you. <laughs> Hi, I'm William. I'm with the uh, Still Water Check Group. Um, I was wondering if you're using ruthenized titanium electrodes. And if so, uh, how did your system deal with the um, scale? I didn't oh, hear that. Uh, we, we were not able to get that question, sorry. Uh, you can't hear well. Can you hear me now? Uh, maybe even. Yeah. yeah. There, there was, uh, no, I can, I can ask you if you want. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'm going to do. Um, I was wondering if you're using your electrolyzer uses ruthenized titanium electrodes, and if so, how do you deal with the scale? Mm, how do we deal with scales? Okay, the, oh. um, it's actually very simple. Um, what we do is we reverse polarity um, quite frequently uh, in, in the process, so um, the scale buildup is, is minimal. And even in hard water, we found that the electrodes will normally run at least six months without um, 
any real scale build up that affects the process. Perfect. Thank you. Any other questions in the room? Or online? Okay, it doesn't seem like. I'm just going to ask myself a question. Antonia. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, sorry, I had my hand raised, but I don't know if you can see it on Teams uh, to ask a question to Pamela. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. go ahead. <laughs> All right, thank you. Great, great uh, presentation, Pamela. Um, I'm interested to learn if you have tried out your intervention for the wastewater treatment, because you said that it can also be used, MAX-5 can also be used for wastewater treatment. So did you try out that or is based on the results that you had already? Uh, we did trial that and we were able to reduce the, the coliforms down from, I think it was... Um, 200. We reduced coliforms in, it was actually in river water, not wastewater, but it was heavily polluted with um, sewage. Um, and then in the tail water of, of a sewage treatment plant that wasn't performing um, from 240,000 E. coli per milliliter to zero not detectable that's great thank you yeah thanks um i think if i can just add something of course go ahead i just wanted to add um when we were talking to some of the industry people um what appears to have not been apparent is that this is a true advanced oxidation process we actually produce oxygen um, to make ozone in the water from the water um, and then rearrange water molecules to improve the advanced oxidation process. Thank you for clarifying. Um, any, any other questions? Can you ask what's the power usage? Yeah, what is uh, the power usage for your system? Yeah, it was um, it was very low uh, on uh, to produce the. Uh, just let me just get on to the three thousand liters to maximize it up to six thousand. It was at zero comma zero two four uh, kilowatt hours per kiloliter. Okay, interesting. For which type of uh, water treatment or wastewater treatment? That was in a in a uh, portable water plant. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, then uh, we will continue on with the second presentation, which is from Seal Water Technology. So. Okay. One second. Okay, perfect. Yeah, so that is. Go straight into it. Go straight into it. Yep. Oh. Step to one side down there. Oh, okay. Is that okay? Like that? Yeah. Good afternoon, and thank you for coming, and thank you to Will for putting this on. Um, I'm Michael. I'm a managing director of Seal Water Technology, and with my partner William, we're here to here to present to you a new and exciting approach to leak detection, active SOMA. We all understand that water leakage through uh, water leakage is a massive problem and accurate leak detection is part of the solution to solving this problem. Today, the majority of leak detectors or the best leak detection is based on acoustics. Unfortunately, all acoustic methods are governed by the fundamental physics of sounding water, thereby limiting, limiting their range to a few hundred metres. So, so given the size of this problem and the limitations of current methods, we set out to develop a new technology that is both long range and makes the leaks do something which is detectable when we perform our tests. So i.e. make it talk back to us. And from this, we invented a new transmission technology, which we call Active Sonar. Oh, gone too far, back too many pages. So how, how do we do this? Uh, we, what we do, we generate a very small but intense pulse, which is injected into the pipe. This pulse travels down the pipe and interacts with points of interest. These interactions we can detect 
And from this, we can calculate the distance out to these points of interest, leaks being one of them. Now I'd like to hand you over to William Smith, our technical director. Thank you, Michael. So just to briefly recap the technology, we have made a technology breakthrough in transmission. And for the first time, that makes feasible the use of sonar type devices and other water pipes. Um, so uh, one of the current members, Jenny, uh, she's set up uh, an instrument and is taking a reading off the pipe. That's a 15 minute exercise to set up, take a reading, no disruption to water flow. And along the back is an actual scan. So the neutral axis, the middle of that scan, is the line pressure of the pipe. Above that uh, is a pressure increase. Below that, uh, a pressure dips, pressure, pressure back ends. And these come from the echoes we see. So wherever you have a line pointed downwards, that's a T or an intersection or, or a bend. So it gives us the architecture of the pipes. Um, and that is seven and a half kilometers through plastic three inch pipe. So it's very long range. So paying attention just to the left hand half of, of that scan, right at the front of that on the far left hand side is our transmission point. It's a single finger. That has caused seven and a half kilometers of pipe to talk back to us with noise. It's that one event. And the distance along the, the spectrum uh, gives us the distance to the anomaly or feature. I want to point out to you the sugar throating section because I'll, I'll point that out to you on GIS map on the next slide. And significantly, there were 25 millimeter pipes teed off the line uh, going to some large properties, and, and, and they're significant for the next slide as well. And amongst those 25 millimeter pipes, you can see a characteristic curve of what a T intersection looks like. And one of them is a little bit different. So that one in the middle has a leak. That's a classic leak signature. And that's what we're trying to pull out of the, uh, the spectrum. Right. Next slide, please. So when we overlay that on the GIS map, you can see near the top of the map is, is a, a red circle. We transmit it from that location. Scans on both ways. It's hit an intersection. I might just point out that early part of the scan, the returns are too powerful and they tend to overwhelm the amplifier in the instrument, so it clips top to bottom. So we don't see a lot of detail. Once we're out about 750 meters, we start to see quite significant detail. So that first intersection is in the blind zone. But we're most interested in the portion of the scan that came down, and then at the bottom of the page, we get a big return off this intersection. That should be thrown. And along to the right, um, that's where we found the abnormal fitting. We visited that site and confirmed there was quite a substantial leak. So, thank you, Michael. Thank you, William. So where are we? We've got a te technology that can identify at distance leaks, T's and elbows. It does not disrupt or damage pipe networks. Importantly, as William mentioned, it, it, works, it works in all types of pipe materials, plastics included. The inventive step in the physics has been established. And backing this up, we have a very strong patent with uh, 23 claims registered. So where's the value in all this? Well, it's long range, so we can accurately survey a, a, a pipe lengths in kilometre lengths comparing to acoustics every couple of hundred metres if there is access to the pipe. Uh, we only need a few units to mo monitor a DMA and it will work and it, it will enhance and work in conjunction with existing smart networks. Touch a little button, you got it. Parallel to developing uh, our hardware, we're developing uh, uh, various software packages, map plotting included. We'll be conducting uh, proof of concept trials in the UK, Europe, and the US. Uh, to expand the business, we're forging partnerships with um, uh, industrial leaders, leak detection companies, utilities. Revenue generation will be through licensing and subscription agreements. 
So thank you for listening. And I trust this uh, brief introduction has given you a, a clear understanding. This is a truly unique solution to solving water loss through leakage. Thank you. And this is, uh, this is our team. Yeah, thank you very much for your presentation. I think it's a really an innovative technology and it's the first big timing now in Italy with all of the non-revenue funds we have. So uh, thank you. Do you have any questions in the audience? Go ahead. Thank you. And <laughs> next question is, uh, does this technology, or better, the shockwaves, uh, runs only uh, to liquid medium uh, or also uh, to natural gas, steam, air, or uh, compressible, fluid, compressible fluids? Uh, we're using a compressibility phenomenon. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Thanks. We're using a compressibility phenomena, phenomena uh, this time in a liquid. It also works in gases. So it, it, the same principle works in all fluids. Um, the speeds of sound and the physics uh, need a little bit of tweaking, but we got the mathematics and the engineering determined for that. You can set the parameter, the constants, and whatever. And, and the That's correct. Thank you. And it's a really only calculation. Well, it's Bernoulli, it's uh, got some Navier Stokes in there, equations of energy. So there's at least one famous Italian in that. Thank you very much. Thank you for the question. Any other questions in the room or online? Okay, so I'm just going to ask you so, how, how do you know like which way the signal goes? Um, we don't know. We, we need to plot it on a map. Okay. And then because we see T's and intersections, they give us a clue of what part of the map particular signals are coming from. So in the example we showed, we had a leak at a, a T intersection that lined up with a map. If it was on a straight section of pipe, we would need to take at least two readings and triangulate onto that one point in order to um, make sure we reduce the number of uh, permutations. But you can imagine uh, that leak was 3.6 kilometres away. If we didn't associate it with a T, it could have been in a hundred different locations on that network. And we may have had to take three or four readings to determine exactly where it was. But that GIS map was basically a DMA. We can cover that whole DMA in one day taking about 14 readings. And to do that with correlators, you've got to have uh, correlators every 300 metres of pipe. Um, that takes weeks. Thank you. Anyone else with a question? Yeah, just uh, in, in the beginning there was like the picture of the hardware. So in that part there is both the. So in that part, yeah, there is both the the place where you put the shock waves and the detector as well. Yeah, that's that's correct. Do you want to? I, I think there was another slide with uh, yeah, um, the previous. Yeah, so we have to um, develop the signal. Um, it's really easy to make a shock wave in water. You do it with an explosion, but if you do that, you blow up the pipe as well. So we have a system for generating a shock wave that it, it only weighs six grams. It doesn't put any stress on the pipe wall. It's a normal shock, so it's compressed front to back not sideways. Is that the question you were asking? Yeah, also, like, here, okay, there is the shockwave chamber, just to see, like, if it's a bit of the parts of the hardware, how it's, how it's done. Just, just see around the receiver. Yeah, so that one also incorporates, that yeah, that, that, that incorporates the receiver, and we dart log the, the signal that comes off that. Okay. But they can, they can be separated, so okay. you have to send around the receiver at different places. In fact, an advantage to separating them is you won't get that blind zone at the start of the scan. But for expediency, we built the prototypes as both a dual transmitter and receiver. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Any other questions? How much does it cost? How much does it cost? 
<laughs> One time only for you. <laughs> um, I, I guess we're forecasting a cost of about $10,000 per US unit. They, they have to have quite a powerful um, processor and a data logging capability, a web link. There's a little bit of hardware and the receiver is quite complicated and very specialist. Uh, but for, to, for the revenue generation, we'll be uh, charging for the data processing. So it'll be a data upload which you'll be paying for. The, the equipment will either be leased or sold out, but it'll be for the processing, which is the valuable part of it. Thank you. And just last question from my side. So uh, you might have touched this already on your presentation, but can it be used on all materials and all diameters of piping? Uh, yes, um, the particular instrument is, uh, in the example, is designed for pipes up to 200 millimetres, but it's okay. scalable up to um, feeder mains, trunk mains, and the transmission and receive signals are through the water, not through the pipe wall. So it doesn't matter what the pipe material is, it works in everything. Another question, yeah. This is probably the last question. Uh, you know, the, well, other methods are understand are less effective in terms of the distance they can actually achieve. But uh, as far as I know, I mean, I, I'm aware that with the oil and gas business, they are not included. So they actually, they use acoustics, of course, but you don't have to get actually into the pipeline to assess the leakage. Uh, I, I mean, in this case, you need to, to emit the shock rate from the pipeline. So how do you see uh, your, your product uh, to be used also like in high pressure lines where you need to have some force in order to you know <coughs> get the, the, get the short break from the line itself. Well I, I like high pressures. The higher the pressure the easier it is for us to generate a shock and we can do that with uh, smaller equipment. So the problem for us is lower pressure. So we're optimized for 300 kPa, 500 kPa and 900 kPa transmissions. Oil and gas industry, they like to use accelerometers on the pipe wall mm -hmm. and they have to be intrinsically safe equipment. Yep. We can keep all of our voltages below five volts. We can also be intrinsically safe and, and meet that criteria. Yeah, but we do need to have the re resonator does have to contact the fluid. So that's what we need to do. So we need so for us, we go onto a fire hydrant and go on that way. Yep. But obviously that industry would have to get in contact with, with the shop. We need some sort of port, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So connect on, open the valve, do the test, shut the valve, something like that, yeah. I'd like a valve. I don't like being covered in black oil. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you. I think you do. Thanks. So next presentation up is Sami from Hydrodrip. So they have an application, a method for incentivizing uh, water efficient usage, uh, especially like in, uh, in households and in student, um, student houses um, based on water credits. So let's hear from him. Sami, are you online? Yes, I am. Can you hear me, Antonio? Okay, wait one second. We'll just... You can share your screen. Okay. Uh, okay. Can you see my screen? Almost. Yes, wait one second. I'll just move it to the main screen and you can go ahead. Okay. Perfect. Flora okay, George. thank you very much. Thank you. Let me just start at the beginning. I hope my son, I'm so, can you hear me now? Okay. So my name is Samin Pungu. I'm the founder and CEO of HydroTrip. Basically, we developed the Hydro Wallet system, which is a digital water credit platform, which helps people to be incentivized to use water efficiently. So the problem that we got in the water sector right now is that around 300 billion US dollar are wasted every year due to inefficiency in water management. And then we're trying to solve that problem by basically incentivizing people to adopt 
or to go for best practice in water management. So our solution to water efficiency is basically to develop a demand side water market where people can trade a uh, kind of water credit so that they can perceive or they can value their actions on conserving water. So these are the water platform is organized. So in terms of collaboration, so basically there will be uh, people that are needed or the people that we call them the uh, excessive users. These people are using a lot of water, it can be a company or household. And these people that are conserving water. So we want these people to talk to each other in terms of transferring um, water right on the, how they're going to how they're going to use water. So therefore, we can go on a balance or we, we're going to go on an equilibrium of water usage. So the system works like this. So you have first say in my system, which can be this is an example from a hotel industry. So basically you have a in my system where you have your meters and your we have developed our own card reader system. So that talks to our API, which is hydro, hydro, wallet, hydro drip web platform where we could generate analytics and these analytics are going to talk straight to the mobile application. These mobile applications are single users basically in the in the accommodation or hotels. So these people, for example, they find themselves into using too much water. They can request for trade on the platform, on the Adro wallet platform to the efficient user and then the efficient user can answer favorite I can answer in the good faith to the excessive user with more water. And then the ex effect effective user can get his uh, gift or can be a voucher on the MIA. So our solution has been developed ourselves. So we developed the AMI system, which is a smart water metering system, uh, talking straight to our API and web app step system so there are some kind of features that we put in together that can help basically the facility manager and uh, the property to also manage the water effic efficiently so they can track water usage in real time they can get notifications if there are leaks also they can trade on the platform so to date We've developed the software. We get some partnership, interesting plat uh, partnership with the peers. So we call them peers, but public and environmental economics research center. So here in South Africa, they are based on trying to understand and uh, produce quality research in dynamic water pricing. So therefore, the pricing can be a a vector into changing people to into changing how people are conserving water. And in April, we're going for we're going for a piloting and good stuff. We've been a finalist in Blue Ocean this this month in Paris, and we're going for we hope to get the collaboration with the city of Cape Town, where basically we presented our solution. So in terms of the pricing, we charging hundred. US dollar for now or per meter, and then there is a fee on each usage of the individuals. So um, in terms of need, we we need to go in partnership with the smart meter manufacturer so that we can reduce the cost of implementing the system. So develop with our water trading platform and also to finance our, our infrastructure as well as some piloting. So this is my team. And thank you, thank you very much for giving us this opportunity. Thank you very much, Pat Sami, for your presentation. Um, do you have any questions? So just also in the chat, I saw there is a question for me. So just one question from my side is, uh, have you ever tried doing it uh, also for hot water or does it change whether it, what, what water temperature it is uh, or other fluids? So uh, we haven't tried. So the, 
basically there's nothing changing in terms of because uh, what you're taking is the hot water, but you're gonna just take the flow in terms of you're not taking the temperature. And as much as in South Africa we basically we have geysers in our houses, so we're not taking water from the municipality. But uh, from the Europeans, where basically uh, you can get hot water from municipalities, that can be a good starting point, basically to um, to help people to track and get values from you know energy and water saving. Thank you. Any questions that arise? Yeah, there is a question from Claudio Gattavari from Bonomi Group. What would be the perfect market, the mm -hmm. target customer? Yeah, so he's asking what is the ideal market and customer? Yes, the idea of customers right now are hotels and accommodations in general, like your guest houses, where basically people, they're living, uh, they can come in your house, sorry, your house if you are, are Airbnb, like you want to monitor how they're using water in that sense. And you want to incentivize, to incentivize them to use uh, water efficiently. These are kind of application where we're targeting them right now, but there are more larger uh, market where we can go with household, but the, the architecture might change in a sense, but our uh, niche market right now, it's these accommodations. Yeah, perfect. I think I would need to install one in my house because, yeah, my <laughs> house made it's really not water efficient. So, uh, yeah, we, we'll come back to you, Sammy. Okay, thank you very much. Is there any other questions? No? Okay, then we will move forward to the next presenter, which is Clark Tuo. Hi. Hi, Hazan. Hi. How are you? Hi. I'm fine. Thank you very much. Um, actually, I wanted to be on site today and present personally, but um, some of you know I recently become a father, so I couldn't attend. But um, still, I'm here virtually and I'm happy to present. Uh, to you. Let me just share my presentation. Yes, thank you. I hope you had at least one or two hours of sleep tonight. Yeah, <laughs> actually, we were exactly two hours. <laughs> oh, nice. Okay. <laughs> Well, the floor is yours. I will go ahead. We see your screen well. Okay, perfect. So, um, yeah, my name is Fezan Ahmad. I'm the founder of Clar2O, -Oh, Safe Water for a Safe Life. And um, our today's topic is microplastics. So, um, for me, microplastics is a bit misunderstanding because uh, due to the German Federal uh, Environment Agency, microplastics is defined everything smaller than five millimeter. So you could actually take a simple kitchen strainer, put it on your online shop and just claim this is the microplastic filter, but it's not that easy. Because um, Fraunhofer already showed that big particles can be recognized by our body and secreted again, but the small particles are actually the most problematic ones because um, these are able to get penetrated to, through our cells, through our membranes and when we started Clato, oh, there was actually not one study that claimed that microplastics is there or that um, it's, it's in our human body, that it can enter our body by drinking water. And yeah, today there are so many publications that we can no longer save ourselves. So uh, first of all, I want to just say that there are different kinds of measurements. It started from zero up to 300. So we just took the highest one. And um, so uh, there are more than 300 different plastic particles in one liter drink water, de depending on the source of uh, the publication. And um, the small ones in the nanometer range, they are able to, to accumulate in our body. They, uh, there are studies that they were found in our liver, our, our adipose tissue. And maybe you saw um, last year the headline um, that a lot of microplastics was found in the placenta as well, and it was called the plastic baby. And um, so these are different kinds of modern pollutants in our modern society, uh, which no one was aware of when plastic was um, developed. And um, one for me, a shocking moment was actually microplastics in bloodstream and the blood-brain barrier as I'm a biochemist and a biotechnologist. And 
yeah, the blood brain barrier is actually the most highest selective barrier I ever saw in my life. And in, if even microplastics is able to cross it, we need to take action. And this is what Clato O is do doing. So we developed a smart surface technology that is able to bind each kind of plastic molecule by molecular adhesion. Just imagine that there are millions of small molecular arms that grab the plastics out of the drinking water. Um, the good thing is, which is actually one of our USP, our filter works without any pressure. It can filter up to 100%, so we did a lot of different measurements, which were even funded by the German government. And um, I guess one of the most beautiful topics is that our entire filter is regenerative and recyclable which is a high, one of the highest sustainability impact if you have almost no waste at the end of the day. So this is how we are, it works. So we are using our spherical beads. Maybe you see it in the camera slightly here. So these are small spherical silica beads and we have four different uh, coatings that are patented as well. And um, they adsorb the microplastics by different kind of molecular um, forces like hydrophobic, hydrophilic and few more. And um, this makes the difference of CLAR 2O to other filters. So um, we do not have a limit in any pore size or any pressure loss. Um, we can filter down to the smallest molecule, actually. And uh, the most beautiful thing is, <laughs> as CLAR 2O do not only stops um, in filtration of microplastics, so uh, sustainability is also a huge point for us we can regenerate the entire surface, deattach the microplastics, and the filter can be used again. And um, I think especially nowadays, this is a huge topic as well. So as we are working with investors, um, we need to uh, prove that our technology works as well. So um, we <laughs> did the entire range of technologies um, and certified our filter by four different uh, labs. And the last one was even by Eurofins with 100% efficiency, which is for us one of the biggest milestones, actually. So this is uh, one of our test filters. So um, it is 10 times 10 centimeter. We can filter up to 20 liter per minute in the flow rate, um, up to 4,000 liter. One to 12 months, it depends on the size. And as I told before, we are using this spherical bead, so we have almost no pressure loss. We see CLAR2O actually as an um, add-on system in each existing water system, so we would only provide the, these beads in kind of B2B. Um, we would sell in kind of B2C the entire system, and our third business model is actually on the on-site regeneration. So at this point, I just want to mention, I know the five minutes are already over, um, that we are looking for strategic partners, for investors, for cooperative joint developments, and we are really open for each kind of partnership. Um, this is our team. And thank you very much for your attention. At the end, I would like to say the fish has no choice, but you do say no to microplastics in your body. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Pezan. Uh, very interesting technology. Um, does anyone in the room have any questions? Yes, Yes, Claudio, go ahead. Uh, how can we regenerate it, the filter? Yeah, how is the regeneration process? Um, it's actually quite, quite simple. So we developed um, a specific chemical solution. Um, it just imagine it's like a huge tank. We put our spherical beads into this tank. The microplastics deattaches from the surface of these um, beads. I can show you here. And um, then the microplastics is uh, again filtered with another filter of us and the beads can be used again afterwards. And the coating is still um, in intact, yeah. So can, can you do it at all or you need to change the filter and give it back for example, to supplier? That's actually a really good question. When we entered the Will Accelerator, we had the same question, how are you going to put this into a business model? And yeah, we thought in kind of B2C that we would make a payback and collect system. So people can send back their filter to us and they, they get rewarded. We would um, provide an app, they could scan their filter and uh, get a discount for the next filter or the cartridge. And uh, we recycle it in-house, um, 
and afterwards we would provide a new cloud to all filter with the recycled beads. Thank you. There is another question. Uh, have you any idea about the timing, the basic timing for changing the for the regeneration? Ah, yeah. Regeneration, yes. Yeah. So, how much time does it take uh, for sending the filter, regenerating, and uh, coming back to your home? Yeah, That's how a really good question. How frequently? How frequently? So, um, when we started this regeneration technology, and we made it five times. And after the fifth time, we found out due to the um, due to the that, that the surface of these beads are rubbing to each other, the coating gets slightly dis um, dis disturbed and it's not working properly. So after the fifth time, we still had the uh, the the efficiency of seventy percent. So we again thought, let's start in the first cartridge with seventy percent of the efficiency, and after five times, we still have. Um, a fully working filter, and afterwards we would we would recycle the beads as they are made out of silica dioxide and um, build new beads. So have they started a so-called frequency of an average? Yeah. How long do you have to send it? Yeah, do you have any idea of how frequently do you need to like after how many like meter cubes? Uh, so, months? Um, so we recycled or we regenerated our filter after these uh, 3000 liter of water, then we recycled it again and put another 3000 liter and the cartridge. Um, let me show you. It's like 10 times 10 centimeter. And we simulated actually this because as I'm a biochemist, I did the coating, but I still had, it's still not easy designing the entire filter. So we made a huge simulation, it took us one year, and then we simulated how many beads do we need, how big does the cartridge has to be, and how much plastics can we uh, filter out. And then we stayed at three to 4,000 liter with this uh, product. And um, afterwards we would regenerate it and could use it again up to five times. Okay, yeah, go, go ahead, Michael. Uh, William, sorry. Uh, uh, yeah, okay, let's go first to Pamela online. Uh, go, uh, Pavlina, sorry, not Pamela. <laughs> Hi, um, uh, great uh, presentation, Fazan. Uh, what I wanted to ask is, what's the fate of the microplastics after the regeneration process? You said that, you said that then they go through another filtration process. Mm -hmm. So when when does that end? Is there a point where you collect all this microplastic and you uh, do something with it? Yeah, yeah, that's actually, it. this was one of our biggest topics because it does not make any sense for a microplastics company to throw again the microplastics away so it's back in the environment. So we built some kind of, of a distillation technology where we could filter out each kind of different size of, of the filtered out microplastics. And we have two partner companies um, that uh, which are able to uh, melt the plastics again, made a new product out of it. And um, at this moment, only at this moment, we can call Clato O as a sustainable company with almost no waste. And I think this is a really beautiful point. Yeah. That, that's great. It, it also reminds me there is this Lego separator uh, gadget, which just you put all the Legos in and they separate in two uh, layers based on the that. size. So I was thinking something like that about your microplastics. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely <laughs> right. Yeah. Great. Thanks. Yeah, you're welcome, Fabina. Thank you. OK, yeah, there is uh, another question in the room from uh, William. OK, um, on the previous slide, we a schematic of the um, particulate capture. Uh, I think it was before that. A little bit before. This one? That's it. This one? So yeah. So it looks like you've got a couple of uh, benzene rings, and I assume you, in, in addition to microplastics, you set out to. Do you want me to. Yeah, or just. Because uh, I, I think he's not here. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so I assume from your benzene rings that in addition to microplastics, you set out to capture aromatic chemicals. And uh, where I come from in Queensland, uh, a lot of the farmers out west don't have rainwater, they rely on bore water. 
And there's also a booming coal seam gas fracking industry. And the coal gas fracking has been contaminating the groundwater and the farmers are detecting significant amounts of uh, toluene in the water. And I just see that as, as potentially a big application for your technology. Um, yes, actually it is really, but it never came to, into, into our minds as we were focused on microplastics all the time. And um, then we found out, hey, our coating is actually even able to, to bind organic pollutants and uh, toluene as well. As So far as I understood it right, there is some kind of echo in the room, so it's not easy to get the question totally. But um, yeah, we are actually also building our next coating for organic pollutants, for PFAS and PAH and other um, polycyclic organic uh, contaminants. And um, I think that uh, especially today in our modern uh, society where we have modern pollutants, we, we need also a modern solution. Yeah. Thank you very much, Hizan, for answering all the questions. Uh, we will go to the next presentation now, which is Met Zero. From Thank the you very much. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> So we're going to talk about a wastewater treatment technology that is able to recover hydrogen and ammonia. I'll just get the presentation ready one second. Whilst you are doing that, Antonia, I will say how uh, happy I am to be part of the wheel accelerator, the first wheel accelerator, and, and thanks for the opportunity to present even virtually uh, here. I prepare for you the video because sometimes the uh, signal comes and goes, but hopefully that will work. And then I'm here to answer your questions. Thank you, Pavlina. I'm just taking everything up. One second, sorry. Hello, everyone. I am Pamela Codosio, the CTO and co founder of MedZero. Met Zero offers the only retrofitable and energy saving wastewater treatment technology that helps water and sanitation utilities treat their wastewater and recover products of economic value from it. Wastewater treatment companies and operators currently face several struggles. The current treatment infrastructures are at their limiting capacity, while the demand is getting higher due to population rise. Also, the energy costs are high. Considering that 60% of the electricity used in treatment goes to the aeration of sludge, it shows that we are literally throwing money up in the air. On top of that, regulations are getting more and more stringent, whilst net zero targets and deadlines are looming. Our Met Zero solution is based on microbial electrochemical technology, essentially a form of wastewater treatment that avoids aeration and can produce hydrogen. The footage you see here is from our latest three cubic meter pilot at an Northumbrian water treatment plant. The electrode cassettes are removable and their size, number and materials can be altered based on each client's treatment needs. The science behind each electrode cassette is simple. They act like a battery-like reactor with an anode electrode, a cathode electrode, and a membrane. The reactor is submerged in wastewater and bacteria present in wastewater decompose the available organic matter present there. And they release electrons onto the anode electrode. The electron does then travel to the connected cathode electrode, and we supplement the process with a little bit of voltage, 
producing hydrogen and other byproducts in the cathode chamber. So we're offering simultaneous anaerobic treatment in the anode and resource recovery in the cathode and all is packaged now in one reactor. Compared with traditional treatment, we save on energy cost. We provide a smart controllable way to recover resources such as hydrogen or ammonia, whilst we have a technology that can be moved and retrofitted anywhere is needed. Our pilots showed us that the technology's easy and highly beneficial entry point is on the return sludge liquor line to reduce the load and avoid retreatment on the activated sludge tanks, reducing the burden and increasing the available capacity of these tanks. The technology evolved to its current state through various grants. Currently, we are running a three cubic meter pilot in collaboration with Northumbrian Water. We have partnered with Veolia to model the impact of this innovation on their wastewater treatment plants. We secured funding from Northern Accelerator to hire a CEO, and we are invited to submit to the aid for spin out call by Innovate UK. Last but not least, we are part of the Wheel Accelerator program, and we are really excited for that. Today, I'm here seeking connections and partners. So please get in touch if you know of any suitable person who will be ideal to lead the company in the CEO role, to help us write the business case and get approval from the university IP and spin out committee. Secondly, we are looking to partner with innovative utilities interested in this technology in order to help us turn this from a technology project into a product. I forgot to mention that the CEO position comes with equity share in the business. Thank you very much for listening to me and I hope you join us in becoming part of the change. Hello everyone, I am the city. Thank you very much, Pavlinia, for your video. Um, so do you have any questions in the room or anything you wanna ask her? So I'm just gonna start off by asking you, so what is the difference between your technologies and any competitor out there? Uh, what is yeah the main uh, strength you have? Yeah. That's a great question. So the way we differ with from others is that our um, uh, competitors right now, what they do is that they package their technology into container type uh, systems that then they ship out to different uh, breweries or wastewater um, uh, treatment companies. And, and that's how they, they treat their wastewater they receive. Whereas our system doesn't need to add any more footprint to any plant. It can be easily uh, slide into any existing um, activated sludge tank or any tank of any size, uh, and they can start um, treating anaerobically the wastewater and generating hydrogen. And as one of our... Um, potential leads, potential clients uh, at the BP by refinery said to me, this is ideal because it's like a fishing cage that you throw into your tank and then it can reduce your, uh, your um, COD and also can generate your revenue from hydrogen. So this is how we see it. We are not adding any more infrastructure into any place. We are supplementing whatever is existing there. Thank you very much. We have a question from Claudio Gattavari in Bonomi. Okay. Um, uh, what is the size of a, a basic module and how many cartridges there are inside? Yeah, so the size that you saw on the video, uh, the flat one, we have two designs. The flat one, which is right now is one by one because we have a one cubic meter reactor, but the cylindrical ones, they have the benefit that they can be elongated as much as we want them to and also are, are cheaper and, and easier to manufacture than the flat ones. So uh, right now in our pilot, we are testing these two designs to see their pros and cons. But with the cylinder one, because it can become as long as it's needed, it means that it can go into any existing tank without much modification. 
And uh, do, do you know the quantity of bypass produced of byproduct uh, uh, hydrogen per uh, liter of water? Uh, not on the top of my head, I'm afraid of how much hydrogen, because that depends on how strong, how much strength the the wastewater has. So the higher the COD, the more hydrogen we have converted, and the lower the COD, the less hydrogen we have converted. It's based on columbic efficiency, so that's how we calculate. But I can send you some data afterwards if that's okay. Thank you. And what is the average like strength COD you work with? Like the so, best one, let's say? Yes, right now we work with a, a high strength COD that comes after the um, uh, um after the anaerobic digesters. So they're really high strength wastewater, but we are trialing into low strength as well. So this new pilot system that we have right now is with quite a, a low strength COD. Perfect, thank you. Any other questions? We have one. Uh, no, go ahead. Uh, I was meant to ask what um, uh, the salt and pH interval there will be. Salinity and pH. Did you hear that? Uh, not really. Uh, he asked what is the salt, salinity, and pH interval you typically work with. Uh, we work with around the uh, 6.5 uh, pH, yeah. and also, oh, and Antonio, because I, I forgot that they give you a number. So far, the previous pilot we had, uh, we had about um, a COD of 4,500 um, okay. micrograms per liter for wastewater. Milligrams, sorry, milligrams per liter. Thank you. And uh, for the salinity, do you, do you have a number? Uh, not really. We haven't checked salinity, I'm afraid. Okay, thank you. Yeah. There was another question in the room I saw. Oh, no. Yes, power consumption. I understand that uh, uh, it's, it's lower than our than other let's say method. Uh, is there a kind of uh, ratio of comparison? More or less, what is the difference? Yes, so in terms of uh, power consumption, this is what we are testing right now because for all our other pilots, what we are doing is that we are uh, plugging them to a power supply because we needed to supplement the 0 0.6 uh, volts into the into the system to facilitate the whole um, hydrolysis. But now we have developed a, a smart electronic control system that can track and monitor and adjust the voltage input into each cassette, which we are evaluating now in terms of power consumption. But we are anticipating that it's much less than the power supplies we were using in the past. I don't have those data yet because it's part of this pilot we are running. Perfect. Thank you very much. Last question. No, go ahead. Are there variable um, cultures you can apply on the run? Like it's all it's all the same uh, bacteria you work with. Uh, no, we have a mixed culture of bacteria. We did analysis before, and um, it was a, a big percentage of that was Geobacter. But usually, our community is with metal reducing bacteria because of the nature of the wastewater. And also, the way the system works, it creates this electroactive biofilm. So, usually, are these metal reducing bacteria that they attach to the, to the biofilm and, and create this electroactive biofilm that we exploit and we get the electrons from. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, now we will go to our guest speaker, Josef Josef. I will hand the word to Chris before. Hi, yes, I just want to introduce Josef very quickly because we're very lucky to have him with us today uh, to join us. Um, Josef has been in the water sector for about 20 years as an experienced entrepreneur. He is the founder of uh, and CEO of LG Sonic which is present in 55 countries and serving 12 industries, and he's won numerous awards uh, for innovation and entrepreneurialism uh, for his vision on water quality management, on big data-driven technologies, uh, and on environmental monitoring. He's his passion line in green scale-up businesses. He is a co-founder of another three businesses, uh, and in addition to this, 
Yusuf serves as an advisory board member to the European Innovation Council. He's the chairman of the entrepreneurial uh, community Green Growers and of MIT in South Holland. And even on this is not a complete list of his achievements. Um, so we're very excited to have you with us today, Yusuf. Thanks for hanging on and joining us online. Can you, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you clearly. Thank you very much for the uh, introduction. Uh, I think uh, the most important for me is being an entrepreneur. And, and luckily here with, with uh, other entrepreneurs also in the water sector. So uh, today I choose not to share any PowerPoint presentation or uh, uh, any, uh, any movies about the technology. I really wanted to have a chat and I would like to share actually the last 20 years of being an entrepreneur in, the, in this field in the water sector because I think Finally, the, the story of the success, but also uh, the, the, the downside of being an entrepreneur, are the ones which I would like to share with you today. So let me start with the start. How did we? How did I get involved with the, with the water sector? Yeah, I was an intern, so I was looking for an internship when I was doing uh, my study economics. Uh, I was about 20 years old, and it was 2003. So now you can figure it out. I'm 40 years old now at this moment. 20 years later. So, and, and, and the company I started as an intern uh, uh, in is the company I own at this moment. So it's, it's quite a nice story, but it didn't go as, as well planted as we, we hoped it. So in 2003, when we started, it was me, there was like the, 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 the founder of the company, uh, Caroline, and, and there was uh, another person involved in the administration. It was the three of us, we wanted to create this technology to use ultrasound to remove the chemicals from the wall. And you can imagine in 2003, like being an entrepreneur was not as sexy as it is at this moment. So there were not like startups hubs or incubators. It was, it was very basic. Uh, uh, raising money was quite difficult at that time. So it was like being an entrepreneur, very basic being an entrepreneur. So starting a website, trying to, to search for some leads and, and trying to develop the technology. And the technology itself was really amazing. So you could use the, the, the ultrasound, which is the same technology you use for gender reveal uh, echo uh, to, to reduce the biofilm in the swimming pools. That's where it all started. So we thought if we can use this technology, we will avoid the biofilm bacteria to, to, to get attached to the wall of the, uh, of the swimming pool. And by doing that, uh, we will reduce the chemical. And then from that, everyone start talking to us and say, yeah, but we can use it in the cooling tower. We can use it in the irrigation reservoir. What about algae? We can use it. So it start like, yes, we can do that. Yes, we can do that. And we were so in love with the technology, unbelievable. So we thought we are going to, to, to change the whole world. And, 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 and the people which, which didn't understand the technology, we thought like they are stupid, you know, that's it. They are stupid. That's why they don't want to buy the technology. So long story short, we started, we started saying yes to every, uh, uh, every customer. So we went to exhibition, Western Berlin, and, and we had like, we had a lot of people telling us how amazing this technology is and, and, and how special we are, but nobody bought it. And here it comes. Because everyone was our customer, in the same time, nobody was our customer. So long, so I would say like from 2003 to 2010, we went uh, more and more into B2C, B2C, and, and everyone is our customer, one product with 12 sectors. So if you will enter our website at that time, you'll see like one product, uh, which you could notice we are in love with because it was all over the place. And then we had that, like 12 sectors, even in the beer industry, in the wine industry, in the milk industry, we didn't know anything about the industry, but we thought like we can make a change over there. So long story short, 2010, we were bankrupt. The ex-owner of the company came to me and she told me like, Yusuf, nobody give a shit about the environment and nobody want to buy our device. So she decided, I will move to, to, to Malaysia. I'm, by the way, my name is Yusuf Yusuf, as you noticed. I'm living in the Netherlands, uh, originally from Syria. I immigrated to the Netherlands when I was about 12 years old. So I am Dutch, but you can't see it, I'm Dutch. Anyway, so she, we, we are a Dutch company. So she thought like, you know what, I will, I will, I will stop. 
uh, we were technically bankrupt, so luckily we didn't really go bankrupt. But she said, like, I don't have the money to finance it. There is nobody. The, the, the turnover was 66,000 euro, you know, like it was not even a company. So finally, she said she went to Malaysia. She started an Airbnb. And and I was at that moment uh, doing my master in uh, tax law that I first applied. And I thought like, no, there is so much potential in this technology. And I really wanted to take it from where it is to the next level. What went wrong? And and I was still in love with the technology. And I thought maybe that's the problem. There is no customer. We were serving no one. We are not solving anyone's problem because everyone is telling us, if you will do this and this and this, I might buy it. But for me, it's not now. For me, it's not now. So what we decided, I thought, OK, I don't want to be in love with my technology. I will be in love with my customer. From all the sectors, I choose one sector. And the sector I chose, it was the sector which was the most, which value the water the highest. So understand me really good. That was by far the biggest breakthrough in our company. The selection of the market fit was by far the most important decision we had. So it was me, 20,000 euro from uh, a cousin I rented and, 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 and two other uh, uh, employees. I told them, like, guys, you have about six months. I have this vision. We are going to change the technology. We will focus only one type of customer, which has the highest value for our product. And we did a lot of brainstorming. And finally, we choose only one. And that one was the water utilities. So the water utilities, they had a huge problem with the algae. They sell water, so they better value water. Instead of recreation or swimming pool or a, a koi ponds owner. So, and then when we take a look at this kind of customer, the water utilities, we thought like, okay, what do they need? Typical, they had the large water surfaces. So the system need to be solar panel. The water, they needed to see that the algae are dying because that's what we were claiming. Like we control your algae by ultrasound without heavy metal or without copper sulfate or whatever chemical they are throwing in. So they needed to monitor the water. And I'm talking now about 2011. So we, we developed this technology where we are monitoring the water real time. And based on this data, we are going to treat the water. And the whole system was a floating uh, platform with a solar panel. You can look it up in the internet. It's really amazing. Uh, MPC buoy. And the company is LG Sonic. So once we had this basic idea, we asked for a patent, we got the patent, and then we asked the European Commission for a fund, 1 million euro. Don't celebrate too early because we were not happy. We were not allowed to spend it. We only could buy knowledge from different universities. So what we did is we worked with four universities and we told them, can you develop this technology more and more? And can you do that fundamental research? So to back up our claims with some evidence. And finally, uh, uh, finally, we, we got our proof. We knew we are controlling cyanobacteria, the blue green algae in the water with the efficiency between 70 to 90 percent. Do you guys can hear him still, or is no, it just us? No, no, cannot. No, no, not anymore. It's yeah. frozen. Let's just see if he manages to come back. It's right on the cliffhanger of his story. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> come on. Uh, he did that on purpose or something. <laughs> but it's a, definitely a fun story. I mean, uh, good learning uh, from this one. Let's see if he manages to come back. We can give him one more minute and we're just on yeah. break. So if yeah. he's unable to return, we can take our break a moment early. Yeah. But hopefully he comes back. We might, we might <laughs> be able to hear the end of the story after the break. Exactly. Yeah. Do we want to do that? Yeah. Let's just wait one more minute. Yeah, I know it is. Okay, why don't we leave it? Yeah, okay, I'll just share one second my screen again. Um, I just want to remind you all to please vote. So, this was the LG Sonic experience. Um, da -da -da. 
just losing my mouse here. But yeah, so please uh, vote for the startups that we just heard. So this is the QR code and the code. So just remember, now you can submit your vote. Um, and yeah, it's important. So just uh, share your inputs with them. Okay, we can go on a break and uh, please come back everyone at four o'clock sharp Central Eastern time. See you in a bit. And also guys online, please feel free to just uh, stay there. If there's any questions from the audience or any chit chatting you wanna have, just please continue while we take a coffee. Sorry you guys are not here. Robert, I could see a great smile on your face when Yusuf said, uh, this is the business that I started when I was 20 and I'm, this is the business I own when I'm till 43. I could see some. <laughs> That's quite promising, isn't it? <laughs> Hopefully I can say the same when I'm uh, 40. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, Yusuf, we were just commenting about uh, your you, the comment that you started saying that this is something I started at 20 and I'm still owning it at 43. So it was quite promising. <laughs> I, I'm 40, not 43. Oh, 40. Correct. <laughs> right. That's good. So everyone now is now on a break, right? Yeah, it's well, on a we break. Were, we were waiting for your uh, cliffhanger. It just uh, we're freezing when uh, you almost ended the story, I believe. But yeah, <laughs> but uh, no worries. So uh, yeah, I will continue when, uh, when everyone is back. So it's about 15 minutes, right? Yeah, yeah. everybody is back at uh, four. For. Okay, perfect. Then I will be also back. Thank you. Yeah. So I think from our side, very few people are there uh, in Russia. Maybe a seal and who else? Only seal, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah, I think it just might be only seal. Yeah. We were, I was... we were almost there. We were at the, the airport, but uh, missed the flight. So. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I was prepared to travel. Uh, unfortunately, there was a strike in Hamburg airport, uh, and then the flight got cancelled. Yeah, that's a pity. Yeah. And then, and then one, uh, one gets a baby. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Actually, I was looking for flights and taxi and everything. And yeah, then I became a father. <laughs> and at the same moment, I wrote Antonia, I cannot attend. She was like, what? Why? And I was like, yeah, I became a father. And yeah. she's like, oh, okay, I understand. You could also record a video. And I was like, nah, I want to attend virtually, definitely. <laughs> I won't miss that event. Yeah. Very good. I, I see some address on your presentation. There was some German number. Uh, do you have yeah. somebody here? We, actually, we are, we are located in Germany. Really? Yeah. Ah, I thought uh, you were in the US. Nah, nah, we're from Germany, from the south of Germany, um, Karlsruhe, Heidelberg, yeah. Hey, okay, then we should keep in touch. Yeah, You're we are in Hamburg. We are in Hamburg. Hamburg. Yeah, Hamburg. Yeah. I saw it before. Yeah, cool. Definitely, we should. Whenever you're in the south of Germany, give me a call. 
But who would oh, have sure, sure. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's crazy that it, it took us 16 weeks to realize that both of you guys are in uh, <laughs> the same country. Oh, that, that, it's quite I, strange. I was thinking uh, you, you were in the US. Actually, I thought the same about you. <laughs> I thought yeah. you were in the US and I thought, okay, is there any other German startup here? Well, what's happening? So <laughs> <laughs> Oh, God. But yeah. nice. Cool. Yeah. Uh, when when the Will program started, uh, me personally, I was in Dubai. Uh, I moved into Hamburg uh, in March. Oh, why? May I ask why? I was once Dubai for vacation. It was such so beautiful. I loved it so much. Why did you came to Germany? I mean, it's cold here in the winter. It is. It is. But Dubai is um, a lot of artificiality. It's man-made. Uh, but this is, uh, you know, nature here. So sure. there's a lot of lot of things different. <laughs> yeah. Sure. I mean, a lot of people told me that Dubai is more, uh, more, more a shine, like it is a, a being. So <laughs> to be careful yeah. when I'm trying to formulate it, but uh, I, I heard it a few times. But still, yeah. beautiful city for mm -hmm. doing vacation there. Yeah, yeah, no complaints. It's a beautiful city, so much fast. Something which I get frustrated here often is the internet. Dubai, you have high speed internet, and Germany during the call it gets dropped. Yeah, uh, you don't. Yeah, that's that's the major difference I've noted noticed Absolutely. here. Absolutely, yeah. happened to me a lot of times. Middle in a meeting, my laptop broke. I don't know, laptop Wi-Fi was not working, and but. Still, there are in Dubai so many beautiful startup con uh, competitions. And uh, may I ask, maybe we could go for a short call afterwards or another day. Oh, why not? Why not? Let's take it offline. Yeah, sure. That that sounds great because, I mean, you're the expert in, in that in that area. And I would love to get more about it. And especially, how do you get business there? Mm -hmm. no? yeah. yeah. Yeah, let's talk about it. Perfect, perfect. Yeah. It would be cool if it would maybe personally. So whenever you're here or if I'm going to Hamburg, I will let you know and then sure, sure. Yeah. Perfect. Keep in touch. Very good. Ich mache jetzt, oh mein Mikro ist an.
Hi, hi Fazan. Can you can you hear us there? Hi, hi. Great to meet you. What a great presentation, by the way. Uh, thank you. We liked yours too. That's why we. It's a nice time to talk. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I share your frustration with the five millimeter plastics being classified as as um, microplastics. Is yeah, it's crazy stuff. Anyway, um, what we wanted to talk about is, um, I don't know where you are at with uh, marketing your product. Um, what do you mean exactly by marketing? I mean, it's... Um, are you ready to supply, you're in Germany, Rod? Yeah, we're in Germany. So are you ready to supply outside Germany? Yeah, sure, sure, we are. Um, actually, uh, most of our uh, customers and uh, interests are not in Germany. They are outside of Germany, especially in, in Asia okay. and uh, US as well. So only <laughs> few of them are in Germany. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, we we <laughs> we quite a long way from you, so we we wondered, but um, we do have um contact with companies that are dealing with bottled water and things like that okay. um that uh i think marketing your product would to them that kind of company would be a big plus for them because um in in south africa here yeah. it's very obvious if you go to the beach they have teams of people um, literally oh. picking up plastic off the beach um, um, as a job employment opportunity. Yeah. Uh, I would be happy. Aware yeah. of it. Uh, I would be happy. We um, do you have my contact data? We could maybe we could exchange yeah. or just we write. Will, uh, we can exchange it on the on the Slack group. Um, yeah. Yeah, Beautiful. Um, that sounds great. Oh, that, yeah. that, 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 to get an exchange with you to talk about potential uh, marketing steps and especially in uh, and, uh, and, uh, mm. yeah, thank okay. you very much. Yeah, cool. and um, right. so, anyway, if you're going to Germany, you know, yeah, well. <laughs> <laughs> Germany yeah. has a lot of um pay paperwork need to be done here if you want to implement anything, <laughs> so it's not easy for Germans as well. To, uh, uh, but I'm happy to support. Yeah. Okay. okay cool. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks. Uh, thank you. We'll thank you as well. Guys, sorry. Do you do you hear me? Okay. Or remote? Yeah. Great. Yes, yeah. I'm just trying to mic for a second. I'm trying another microphone. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me? Okay, great. Great.
Yes, I am. Uh, can you turn your video on if it's not already? It is on. Well, just mind you, three seconds. Uh -huh. We see you. Wonderful. Yeah, you had us on the end of your seats with your, with your story. Okay. So <laughs> Thank you for rejoining and thanks for bearing with us at the break. I'll hand back to you to, to carry on. Yeah, uh, so it, 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 I was nearly at the end, but I thought like my story was so boring that it just cut me off. Like your time is. <laughs> but uh, so to go back where uh, where is the, where, where start to the, the, the fun stuff, you know, when, when things went right after we had received the one million, we could uh, we could use it to buy in some research from different universities, we had the proof, but it was still not enough uh, because most of the customers, most of the water utilities uh, in the Netherlands and also in, 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 in Germany, they thought like, we don't want to be the first customer. And I don't, I, I don't think they are wrong because at that time, the DNA of a water utility company is to be sure that the water quality is right. So they can't risk the water quality, which I really understand from the perspective. So understand, understanding what they can lose made me also very fast understanding like they will not be my first customer. And what I did after that, I, I, I just make a list of the top 20 water utilities around the world, which I thought they have their water from the surface, so, so lakes or um, lakes or reservoirs. And then the next step is I was looking which one of them they had an innovation department. And that's really a big tip for all the startups. The operation manager or the CEO is not going to buy your technology. For us, what really helped, I had access to the list of the innovation managers. And then I start calling them. They are innovation managers. They have to test out technologies. So it's a win-win technology. It's a win-win situation. Instead of reaching out to the operation manager, which has a problem with the algae, but he can't risk to test a new technology. So with that, I had uh, uh, I had the chance to pitch the technology to American Water, which is the largest water utility in the United States, stock listed uh, uh, company, very innovative. And they told me like we are going to test it for one full year. And we are going to publish if it's good or if it's not good. So it was a big risk for us to, to take, but I really believed in what we have developed. So we give it a trial. It was a 50% prepayment and 50 after one year. So the, the project at that time was about 100,000 euro. We tested, it went really well. And then American Water became our first customer. And we had this large report on a long term effect of the ultrasound on the algae on all the water treatment uh, uh, parameters we had. So from that moment was really easy because we had this reference. We could go to the customer and tell them, OK, come with us, visit the pilot. And every time when we go to a new country, they will tell us, yeah, but Colombia is different and Canada is different. And so every time they will, of course, still raise the objection why they are different, why their water is different. And you will start all over to convince them. But 
Uh, the only difference was at this moment we had this reference where we could tell them, yes, we have done it before, and you you can go and visit that uh, uh, the field. So if I will summarize, actually, the twenty years, uh, the twenty years of 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 being an entrepreneur um, in the water sector, I will say understand the water sector is very conservative. They are not the first runners, so don't try to be. Uh, uh, fixed in your country or in the area you are active. Try to search for different areas. Uh, uh, for example, if you are in Germany, maybe United States will be better, or if you are in United States, maybe Germany will be better. So try to figure out where is the best customer for you around. Try to understand the objection. He, he don't hate you. He just have a lot of problems, and he don't want another problem with the new technology, with the new entrepreneur. So try to understand and take him serious because he will. He's the one which will pay the salaries and pay the technology, and he's the one which understands his problem the best. So really go. If a customer is upset and he's sharing with you why he's upset, that's the most valuable you will get, the most valuable information. So make sure like the next time when you will sit with a different customer, he will not be as upset on the same points. And, and the last one is, of course, you will hear it a lot of times, uh, uh, is build your own team. You know, you can you can over you hire overqualified people, like really pay them the fee piece of that and that company, and they might have you valuable information. But the question is, do they really fit in within your company? So I'm not saying like don't high don't hire very high uh, uh, profile, but definitely don't only hire this kind of high profiles because those can also damage your company because they need to push it and a very fast. Uh, very fast uh, 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 steps which you are not ready for. So I think you grow with your own, with your own organization. So build a team with the people which really believe in your technology because it, it, it's not like a line like that. It will be like more, much more uh, a struggle to, to build the business. But of course, we are in the water sector. It is our time as an entrepreneurs with the innovative technologies to, to, to be now and to scale the technologies. Um, so that's my, my story. It's have been really fun to scale the technology. It has been really fun to 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 build the the, the company. To now at this moment we are active in 96 countries. By the way, not the 55. 55 is only one type of the product, but uh, uh, it, it is worth it. So don't give up. Do your stuff and and uh, success. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yusuf. I don't know whether you can hear it very well online, but there's a loud applause over here, so we're, we're very appreciative. Um, are, are there any questions for Yusuf before we say goodbye to him at all on, the, on his journey? Oh, we've got Robert's raised a hand. Robert, come up here and, uh, and share your question. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Yusuf. I, I was wondering, because you mentioned um, um, back in the days, your first client was the uh, American water company. I was just wondering, how did you manage to, uh, because I think also a pilot was not the, the big money, so to say, how did you manage your first client from the Netherlands in America? So how much did you visit? And because I, I think it can be quite a challenging thing also because it has a lot to do with trust, of course, and uh, it's not only about your technology, but also about, yeah, who are you, et cetera? Yes. yes. Uh, most of you will know IO Utilities. <laughs> they had this, uh, 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 I, I don't know if they still have it. Uh, 2012, uh, they had these um, special meetings where they will, sell, they will send a couple of technologies to, uh, to water utilities. And the water utilities innovation manager, they will choose which kind of uh, technologies they would like uh, to see. Yeah, so that's that. actually how, yeah, that was the first contact. So we knew which water utilities we wanted. So what, what I had done is I had like this list, like those are the water companies. And it was for me very clear, we need to be in the United States and not in Europe. Because in the United States at that time, they were still and still, they are using copper sulfate in their lakes. So our added value was quite clear and fast with, with them. And, and the mentality in the United States is quite faster to adopt the new technologies. So we wanted to be in the United States. We knew like there were a couple of companies and we knew which innovation manager we want. At that time was uh, Paul Gardariado or something like that. So we knew we want him. 
And we were lucky, like they choose finally us to do the presentation and it was my colleague Lisa Brand which did it and, and yeah, it was just the initial contract and then and then we started the, the negotiation from there. And oh, the, thank you for that. But and how did you I, I meant more? How did you manage the doing the pilot and, and uh, was somebody of your company uh, there for uh, the complete period of the pilot or? No, no. You mean financially? How did we manage it or physically? Like physically. No, we, we were. Physically, like uh, our system was uh, controlled by internet, so we could follow the the, okay. the the pilot real time. We didn't need to be there, but we went about once in the three months there to discuss with the customer to see how it goes. And we had like a bi-weekly uh, meeting with with the innovation team. Uh, they did a lot of other tests, so so that's how we managed it. And and they paid us about fifty percent, which was about hundred thousand euro, I believe. To do the pilot, so we could, we were lucky, we could finance that financial it without an external uh, VC. Cool, thanks. Okay. I uh, I don't know whether you've had some complication with flights today, so I, I wonder if that's behind your question and why you were uh, asking these things. Um, let me open the floor again. Anyone in the room has any questions for you? I, I've got a question for you, um, in that uh, we've got a mixed audience today. We've got many startups uh, and suppliers with us. We've got a, a, a lot of utilities in the room as well. Is there anything you think we should be doing differently as utilities to help support new innovations coming through and new startups coming through? It, it, it's, it's already a trend where you are going to invest more and more in the innovation department. So don't expect operational people to adapt to new technologies. It's not their job. Because again, innovation, if it's true innovation, it means a true risk. That means they will sit with the, with, with the entrepreneur and they will ask him like, how many liters can you filter uh, a week? And he will say between 20 and 200. And the operational manager cannot take that risk. So what I would say, invest more, uh, uh, much more money in an innovation team and give them the KPIs where you'll tell them like, at least test out three or four technologies a year or have this pilot plan where they are allowed to make mistakes and where they can take the risk without having the, 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 the health of the people in risk. Super, thank you. Uh, and that, that's well timed because for, for, for us in the Italian sector here, uh, it's, it's a, a time of a lot of change. So it's, it's good to hear that advice and we can think about how we might take that award and we'll be speaking to you later on today about what that, what that change is looking like. But now, Yusuf, I just want to say thank you very much for giving up your time. We're really, really delighted and privileged to have you with us and hear your story and your experience. So thank you very much. One more round of thank you very much, everyone. Wonderful, right. We will get on with the rest of the agenda now and uh, hear from the remaining five uh, startups. If you haven't already, please do remember to go on to uh, Menti and place your votes uh, on who you think is the most promising, the most exciting from the presentation that you did here this morning. Um, we will be handed out a, a very uh, honourable and exquisite prize to um, the winner of your vote. So please don't forget to put your votes online. Uh, for the startups, but we'll go to Mixanops now, um, who are online. Um, we've got a video from Mixanops which we'll play, and then Ishan should be with us to take your questions. Um, Ishan, are you online before we get going with your video? Yes, I'm here. Wonderful, thank you. Okay, we're just in the process of getting your, your video up on screen. Hello, everyone. My name is Ishin Kaya. I am the founder and principal engineer at the Nixon of Systems. We are located in Waterloo, Ontario, Canada, and we reinvented the wastewater aeration by uh, using plunging micro bubbles instead of rising. Apologies. IT issues that are coming. Thank <laughs> you. 
Hello, everyone. My name is Ishin Kaya. I am the founder and principal engineer at the Mixanup Systems. We are located in Waterloo, Ontario, Canada, and we reinvented the wastewater aeration by uh, using plunging micro bubbles instead of rising bubbles to meet natural targets sooner. Our story begins uh, with uh, when I was a wastewater engineer trained by British Oxygen Company in England and designed a few oxygen systems and uh, upgrading wastewater treatment plants and heavily competing with uh, conventional aeration systems. Years later, I developed Pajama in Canada as a novel aeration system, allowing pure oxygen injection when needed. I established a, a company, Mixanox, in 2011, and this is one of my hands-on pictures from those days. First pilot was achieved 45% energy savings, and the second pilot study uh, uh, adding inline sensors and validation research which led to uh, commercial application in uh, uh, Manitoba, Canada, increasing the capacity of a small treatment plant without increasing, uh, adding uh, reactors. This is our team today. Blowing compressed air at the bottom of a reactor is a 100 years old method. Deep tanks has to be emptied for installation People has to go down to uh, install diffuse aeration systems, hundreds of diffusers, and then uh, fill the tank and uh, to be able to use the system. So rising bubbles suffering from low efficiency, substantially undissolved air going to the atmosphere, causing excessive agitation and high energy consumption. Undissolved air causing proportionally gas stripping as well, maximizing the fugitive greenhouse gas emissions, especially the nitrous oxides. Our system, Pajama, can be installed in a, a deeper reactors and using a pump, pipeline, and nozzles so that day installation is possible. Plunging water jets just under the surface and down to the floor, along the floor, up to the surface and mixing the entire tank very gently, no surface agitation. Aspirating the atmospheric air when needed, creating micro bubbles with, uh, very efficiently. And as the bubble goes down and uh, they become smaller and then the basically transferring more oxygen using less air, which causes proportionally less greenhouse gas emissions. Servicing is fast with camlock quick connections. Operator can stop the pump easily within minutes of time and put, uh, cleans and puts back the uh, nozzle easily. Side-by-side -side comparison, bubble size of very small magnitude, two magnitudes uh, smaller uh, gas uh, bubbles achieving high efficiency, less air for achieving same oxygen amount, less greenhouse gas emissions proportionally, and uh, key components to uh, maintain just a pump and dozen of nozzles instead of hundreds of diffuser at the bottom of the tank and you can't reach easily. P uh, pajama uh, enables pure oxygen injection, creating the possibility for boosting of the existing uh, treatment facility, and also com it comes with a comparative cost of half of the price of a diffused aeration system. We observed side-by-side -side winter temperatures, uh, six to eight degrees higher than uh, diffused aeration, causing better nitrification in the winter time. As a summary, six times oxygen transfer efficient, 95% less greenhouse gas emissions, fugitive greenhouse gas emissions, 50% less energy use, further greenhouse gas emissions, and fast plug-in and inst installation in a day, serviced in minutes, built and serviced in local resources, which means a lower uh, carbon footprint, and comes with the warmer reactors in the winter temperature as a bonus.
Thank you for your attention. Super, thank you very much. There's a slight delay in the video and the, in the video and the audio, but I think it worked, it worked okay. Uh, if we can bring push it back into the screen. Are there any questions that we should have from anyone in the room? Yep, we've got a question. Would you like to come up and use the mic? Although I'm trying to advance that, uh, just a quick question. Maybe, maybe if you talk with this idea, that we can forget it. Uh, how can you claim the reduction in uh, the tropes of side emissions? Because you claim a very low emission of uh, nitrous oxide. I didn't understand uh, which is the reason for this. I couldn't uh, hear very well. Uh, that there's noise in the line. Would you repeat again? Uh, nitrous oxide. You're asking about nitrous oxide, but I didn't get the question. Well, I have seen in your final slide that you claim a reduction in the emissions of nitrous oxide with respect to a conventional system, which is the main reason for this, sis? Uh, well, that, that's, a, that's a side effect. Uh, it's a good side effect, so to speak. So the, the main goal is uh, making it energy efficient uh, mixing and aeration. And uh, we discovered that it's a, a it's housing less uh, carbon dioxide emissions, uh, and also uh, we suspect that it's going to be same thing happening for the nitrous oxide. We didn't measure anything, but the uh, carbon dioxide and nitrous oxide has similar uh, dissolution uh, values, so that they would uh, they would be similar. So that. That, that's why we are looking for pilot uh, uh, studies to uh, to prove that one uh, publicly. Thank you. Any, any other questions from in the room? So we have one minute. This is question one, I think. I have a question. Some information about the geometry of the oxidation bank for guarantee the recirculation. Uh, for geometry, we could we could geometry. fit in any geometry, yeah. and uh, yeah, uh, but it's deeper the tanks are better the energy efficiency. So, yes. uh, especially the uh, depth versus width ratio is very important. So, if you have a shallow pond. Uh, with a uh, you know uh, one meter or two meter depth and with a huge uh, pond, our system uh, or vertical plunging jets wouldn't work uh, as good. So deeper the tanks are better. Six meters, seven meters, even nine meters depth that we have to test it to uh, prove it. But just I uh, I uh, haven't designed uh, horizontal versions of this uh, system. A British oxygen company, I've seen uh, horizontally it works up to 12 meters, the horizontal jets. The vertical jets, uh, it's going to be working uh, for up to eight meters for sure if you use plastic media and MBBR type of media in it. So it's going to be, it may be uh, even deeper, but we have to uh, test that. And unfortunately, uh, modeling of CFD modeling is. And very uh, complex, and uh, uh, I was getting code that uh, is more expensive than uh, actual building the system. That's why we're looking into a, a pilot system so that we can see a real, a real thing rather than relying on the uh, CFD analysis. I hope I answered the question. Yes, thank you. Sure. We've had lots on this side, so that's superb. Are there any other follow-up questions? No. Okay, lovely. Thank you, Ashwin. That was fantastic. Appreciate your time. We're going to move move on now. Uh, we're going to go to Moptech, um, who have also provided a video, so we will just take a moment to get that up on screen, um, and then uh, we should have Sheila uh, uh, with us in a moment um, to take questions. Bonnet, are you there? <laughs> 
Hi, Chris. Yeah, I'm here. Hi, great. Wonderful. We can hear you. We're, uh, we'll just get your video set and uh, we'll leave it from there. Thanks. It's called the Flock Opex Recovery Process, or four as we call it. I'd like to share with you what we've been developing at Optum. It's called the Flock Opex Recovery Process, or four as we call it. Let me share my screen. There we go. Okay. So perhaps before I get into what four is and how it works, I would share with you the rationale behind why we developed it. We understand that not all companies' primary focus is environmental sustainability, but more so profitability. We wanted a way to link environmental sustainability to financial returns and thus add a capitalist flavor to the green engineering framework. As for what four does, well, it is a resource recovery solution and it is aimed at recovering and recycling metals from wastewater and sludge. The objective is to reduce the volume of wastewater or sludge that reports to evaporation ponds or landfill sites and thus reducing companies environmental footprint. There are three main industries which four is applicable for the potable water fast moving consumer goods and mining for the first two potable water and fast moving consumer goods. The objective there is to recover metal based coagulants from water treatment residuals with the aim of recovering and recycling them back into the process. So beneficiation. For mining, the objective there is valorization, where we're looking at recovering valuable metals from wastewater and tailings in order to help increase companies' bottom line. So what are the implications of four for some of these industries? Well, the three main ones. In general, for the fast-moving consumer goods and potable water, we found that it is cheaper to recover and recycle these metal-based coagulants as compared to buying virgin material. For the case of mining industries, we found that recovering these valuable metals through four helps achieve and increase companies' revenues. In addition to that, we are able to show, or we were able to show that we can reduce the cost associated with transporting and disposing of this wastewater and sludge because we have reduced the volumes. Further impact of that is the environmental one. Because we're able to recover and recycle these metals, we are able to reduce the volume of wastewater and sludge that reports to the environment and thus help reduce companies' environmental footprint. The last one, trade and price fluctuations. Through four, we can assist increase uh, circular economy. And an example of this would be South Africa, where we import bauxite in order to produce aluminum for the manufacturing of aluminum sulfate. In countries or geographical locations like the UK, there the focus would be slightly different. It would be focused around reducing the impact of market price fluctuations of coagulants on treatment works. So how does four work? Well, it's a treatment combination of about five steps, bleaching, filter press, donor analysis, traditional membrane processes such as nanofiltration and reverse osmosis followed by neutralization. As I've mentioned, we've done some work with uh, some utilities and here are three examples. One is a utility with about 430 megaliters per day. And the last one is one with three megaliters per day. The first facility was looking at reducing expenditure and through four, we were able to show that because we can recover and recycle metal-based coagulants, we could lower the coagulation purchase costs for this facility. In addition to that, we were able to also show that we can lower their costs for disposal of these water treatment residuals. The second facility had an issue with ocean contamination. And there again, we were able to show that we were able to reduce the volumes of water treatment residuals sent to landfill and um, water, body, water bodies. Uh, yeah, the last one really had an issue in terms of reducing the operational expenditure. And there we were able to show that specific to the coagulation and flocculation stage, we were able to assist them reducing the operational expenditure by about 30%. An illustration of this, figure one on the left are water treatment residuals we got from a treatment plant. There they used aluminum sulfate as the coagulant. Figure 2A is the leached water treatment residuals just after the process has started. And 2B is the final aluminum that we were able to recover from these water treatment residuals. So what lessons have we learned through the, you know, this research and experimentation? Well, there are two primary factors. The first one is that we are able to selectively recover the target metals by about 
This means that we can selectively remove the target metals from other unwanted metals as well as organics by a factor of 95%. In addition to this, for the metals that we do want to achieve and recover, we're able to do so with a recovery of about 90%. So what are our desired outcomes? We're really looking for strategic partnerships to further assist us and complement us in piloting for to portable water utilities, as well as fast moving consumer goods. We're also looking to raise capitals in order to expand our operations with the aim of commercialization. And lastly, we're looking for further research and development operations uh, specific to mining houses in order to streamline and optimize our full process specific to the valorization of mining wastewater. Thank you. Fantastic. Thanks very much, Ronald Zane. That was excellent. I'll just bring you back up on screen so we can see you in, uh, in the room here. Have we got any questions for Ronald Zane from anyone in the room? Yeah. I got one. Sorry. Yes. Uh, how does select selectivity work? How does he ma ma manage to select the methods to recover? So how, how do you manage to select the methods to recover? Can you, can you repeat that? I heard selectivity. How did you manage to select the methods to recover? The metals. Yeah. Oh, so the metals we recover are really a function of what the water treatment plant is using as a coagulant. So if you look at the facility that I mentioned earlier, which utilizes aluminum sulfate, there the objective would be to selectively recover aluminum from other metals as well as organics that we find in the water treatment residuals. Okay, Chris, are you there? Hi, sorry, we are on you. <laughs> it was fun to have at some point, wasn't it? How do you design the process um, to select which metal to recover? Okay, I'm not, I'm not too sure if I understand the question, but I'll, I'll, I'll try and explain it as best as I can. So the first part, as I mentioned, uh, the selection of the metal that is targeted to be recovered depends on what the coagulation of the coagulant of choice in the water treatment plant is. In terms of how we selectively recover that specific metal, that's largely to do with the donor and dialysis phase, and there, there are a number of variables that we manipulate. Uh, the first step would be deciding which type of um, ion exchange membrane we use and going in a bit deeper there to depend on its geometry. So if it's a homogeneous or heterogeneous type of membrane, once we've decided that, then we decide how we want to put those me uh, membranes together, whether it's in series or it's in parallel. And then we then look and hone in on the microstructures of the specific membranes and have a look at the different diffusivities of how the membranes operate relative to the specific metals in the water treatment residuals. So if you have a combination of, for example, aluminium, copper, and iron, they have a difference in their valency, which is their charge, as well as their atomic radius. And based on those, we can manipulate those specific target ions depending on what diffusivity and what type of membrane that we have. So for example, the first membrane in series might be a heterogeneous membrane with a very high diffusivity for aluminum ions and a very low diffusivity for copper ions, which means that the most of the penetration of metals you get on the other side will be aluminum ions. And most of the rejection you get on the other side of the membrane will be your uh, copper or iron ions. Then we, we do the same thing um, Cons consistently. And um, at the end, after a series of, um, of those membranes and a series of those chambers, then we're sitting with the final product that we want at the selectivity we want. I'm, I'm not sure if that answers your question. So yeah, it's a function of you know, the membranes, the geometry, diffusivity, um, and the specific characteristics of the metals. So their atomic radius, their valency, their charge, etc. So the process you're using is selective dialysis. Select yes, dialysis. so donor dialysis is one of the processes in the treatment train. So you'll see that the first step is leaching followed by filter press. Then from filter press, it's donor dialysis. 
Then for nanofiltration and reverse osmosis, that's where we actually concentrate our target metals through nanofiltration. We're able to recover the process acid we're using and separate it from the metals. And then with the reverse osmosis step, then we're able to concentrate further the solution of coagulant that we have by removing any excess water. Okay, final question. So, is treating the brides from electrodialysis? Sorry, I, yeah, I'm struggling to hear. I'm sorry, sorry if I'm bothering a little. Um, so, if I get it right, you're treating the brides from electrodialysis through nanofiltration and reverse osmosis, right? No, we're not using electrodialysis. We're using donor dialysis. Okay, maybe I'm missing the difference there. But okay, so you you through the donors uh, dialysis, you like enrich the strings with the metals you you want, and then you proceed to concentrate it even further with the LO, right? That's not the quite. So the, so once we're at the donor dialysis stage, we are not enriching um, the water treatment residuals. We're, we're using the water treatment residuals as they are, but we are then targeting the metals that we want from the water treatment residuals using donor dialysis. Okay, okay. And final question, then I leave you alone. Um, so um, do you have experience in removing monovalent and divalent ions? Like yeah, so... But one of the interesting things about a donor dialysis is um, if you look at the process, it's divided into three different sectors. Um, okay. You have the kinetically driven zone, followed by the electrochemical driven zone, followed by an osmosis zone. So in general, you are concentrating your metals higher than your initial, your final product of metals is concentrated higher than your initial volume that you start off with. And part of that has to do with the valency of the metals. So how you pair your acid or your donor, your proton donor with the metal, the target metal um, is highly dependent on how you can separate different metals. So to, to shorten and answer your question, yes, we are able to se selectively separate metals um, using their valencies. Okay, but have you ever removed like uh... Have you ever enriched uh, the strings with magnesium or lithium So our focus has been um, a lot of uh, water treatment residuals with um, aluminum sulfate, or I suppose an aluminum okay. hydroxide form, as well as um, iron sulfate. But what we found though, is that in that water treatment residual body, for example, if you're looking at recovering aluminum sulfate, you do get other metals such as magnesium, such as sodium, because of the nature of um, what is you know, in the water when it's being coagulated and flocculated. So part of the selectivity that I mentioned when I said we're able to reject certain metals with a 95% selectivity incorporates metals such as sodium in relation to aluminum. So a valency of, of one sodium with the valency okay. of three positive for aluminum. So yes, we are able to selectively separate metals um, with different charges. Okay, very interesting, thank you. Just, just to add on to that, so um, what we also found that was interesting is up to a certain point, um, I mentioned that we can selectively you know, reject them with about 95%, but through tests, we actually found that um, some of the the very little amounts of sodium or calcium that are actually left in the things that we've been able to recover actually further enhance the coagulation and flocculation process because they in themselves act as metal-based coagulants. So that was also an interesting um, byproduct of some of the research that we did. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. Fantastic. Thank you very much. For the thank you. <laughs> Super, well, we will continue to press on. We have uh, three more excellent startups to hear from. So, uh, the next startup is Hydro. We have Synod with us online. I can see you, Synod, so I know you're there, which is, which is wonderful. Um, and uh, Synod has a, a smart water network solution uh, that sells power and able to monitor the flow of temperature and pressure. So, uh, Synod, I believe you're able to share your slides, so over to you.
Right. Can you hear me? Yes, I see you very well. Thank you. All right. Um, good afternoon, everyone. And I hope all of you are having a nice time discussing several new technologies and applications today. Uh, I'm here to present you Pydro, a clean tech startup from Hamburg, Germany. Uh, and our topic for today is the value of real time water monitoring in distribution networks. OK, uh, let me start with a little bit about Pydro, the evolution of Pydro. It was fun, founded in the year 2016 as a spin off from a Hamburg Technical University. It was through a scholarship that we received. And by 2018, we already had the proof of concept with our working prototype. And fortunately, in 2021, we were able to install our first pilot project with a water utility in Switzerland. And it is still working. By the end of quarter three, 2021, we were able to have our German drinking water approval, which is a very difficult one, a very good standard for us to be uh, proud of, uh, DVGW. And 2022 has been a great year for us where we won uh, an award from EIC Accelerator along with the fund uh, that helps us to move forward today. With, that, uh, with the help of that fund, we could expand our team and then uh, we developed a lot more into the product fine tuning stage. And 2023, uh, we started off with the Will program and we have several uh, pilot projects aligned uh, to follow it this year in Europe, uh, in Australia, and in Middle East. So at Pydro, uh, the mission that we defined for Pydro uh, is with the understanding that water utilities need more data for insightful decision making. And that too, the data from the critical infrastructure, the pipelines. So if you most of us are aware that flow meters play a key role in providing information from the pipe network. Uh, installation of uh, flow meters in critical locations provide uh, information about um, water balancing, uh, pre-location of leaks. At the end of the day, all this adds together to the optimization of the flow and ensuring customer satisfaction. So flow meters is a key, key component in the system. Now, today's flow meters are powered either by batteries or mains or renewable powers, power sources like uh, solar and wind. So all these powering sources have its own limitations. And this is where we as Pydro would like to introduce our self-powered smart flow meter, which works on the turbine flow meter concept. Uh, our flow meter, is capable of generating power at the point of installation, wherever it is in the network, at the point of installation from the flow of flowing water. So the power that is generated or harvested from the flowing water is saved on a battery backup, and uh, it is continuously saving. The power is continuously backing up the battery, and once it is backed up, even if the flow goes below so any limit, it's fine. It can work. Uh, it has got an inbuilt temperature and pressure sensor. So the flow meter has uh, flow measurement, temperature measurement, pressure measurement, and from the flow, the volume can also be calculated. Um, it has got an IoT module with built-in LTE CATM1 SIM card. So it's completely end-to-end -end, uh, and it has no cables attached. So with the help of this IoT module, we are able to transfer the data continuously to the network. And this is where we can help digitalization or truly dig making the network truly digital. So next slide, I will show you uh, a little bit comparison of our product versus the battery. And this is this should be the most important takeaway from, from our uh, discussion today. Today, when the utilities want to move towards digitalization of the network, uh, once or twice data per day is not good enough. Uh, the utilities need more measurements and more data transfer per day. So those battery powered flow meters which claim 10 years life, uh, the life comes down to a few months if you begin to transfer the data every minute. Uh, with the PIDO flow meter, uh, we can do continuous measurement and data transfer every minute and the battery is recharged from the flow. 
So this is the advantage that we would like to bring to the utilities today. Uh, from the ins uh, installation perspective, it can be in chambers or over, over ground installations. Uh, it has got no cables attached, and if the depth of the chamber is uh, deep, we have an extension cable to the antenna, which can be installed on top of the ground. Uh, with the flow meter, as I mentioned, we get the data logger, uh, the LTE CATM1 SIM card module, so the data is also part of the package. And to execute all this together and, and, and to ensure customer uh, support, we have a great team. Uh, we've already grown to 10, um, 10 of us to this, uh, this year, and it's uh, continuing. So um, now over to you, and we are happy to be working with you, uh, listening to your questions. Uh, if you want us to execute a pilot project, or you know, you're always welcome to visit Hamburg. Thank you. Thank you very much. Do we have any questions for Priscilla from the audience? Yeah, yes. I think I heard you last time. Okay, Jack. Uh, what is the rangeability of the meter? Uh, the flow, flow can be measured uh, from 0.28 liters per second up to 14 liters per second. And uh, uh, at which pressure drop? Yeah, uh, at, at the maximum, uh, the, the flow meter at the maximum of 14 liters per second, the pressure drop is around 0.2 bar. Thank you. Second. Thank you. 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 Thank you uh, unfortunately, not uh, Ishin, because uh, it has got uh, rotors inside uh, with the wastewater. If more sediments and solid particles come, uh, we suspect it could block the rotor to an extent that uh, flow cannot be measured. So at the moment, we would like to stay with the drinking water, which is quite clean. That what, um, very unfortunate. That would have been fantastic if you could me measure wastewater. <laughs> yeah, let's work towards it. Thank you. Any other questions in the room at all? Yep, yeah, What is the cost of the device? What's the cost of the device? Oh, pardon? What's the cost of the device? Cost, <laughs> cost of the device, uh, our target is to bring down to 4.5 thousand uh, euros uh, during the scale up phase. Would you say 4.5 thousand or 1? Say the price again, please, Sinosh. Uh, 4,500 euros. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry, I Have you been able to test it in the field at all? Pardon? Have you been able to test the unit in the field? Yes, yes. Uh, sorry, I was not able to see uh, as uh, the screen share was on. So, um, in 2021, we start. We had our first installation uh, with the uh, uh, utility in uh, Switzerland, and it is still working. It is installed between two storage tanks. They wanted to prove the concept before taking into the uh, distribution network. It is still working, and they have already agreed to proceed uh, to the distribution network because they have seen the performance for almost two years by now. Thank you. Any other questions? No? Okay, I think that's wonderful. We'll, uh, we'll press on. Thank you very much, Sina. Uh, Thank you. Last it's... question. Uh, what yes, Sina. What sizes of pipes, or standard pipes, you have? Yeah, yeah. At the moment, we have our, our final engineering sample, which is going to the market. Uh, it's a, a 100 millimeter or four inch uh, pipe size. That's the only one? That's the only one. We would like to execute a few pilot projects with that unit and then move to uh, other sizes. Like we've been getting requests for 80, uh, 150, and 200 millimeter. Thank you. Yeah, my pleasure. We're going to press on now uh, to be here from Hulo. Uh, we've got Robert with us online. Uh, they have a software uh, to design DNA to detect and localize and classify anomalies on the network. So, uh, Robert, it's over to you. 
Thank you very much. Um, I'll share my screen. You can see it well. Okay. Perfect. Um, yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I, I did my best to uh, to uh, to translate everything in the presentation to uh, to Italian and to make sure that, uh, that uh, everything is clear for everybody. And uh, today uh, started a bit uh, sadly because this morning we were very enthusiastic, Frank and I, uh, about going to uh, Brescia. Uh, 4 a.m. we were in the car, but then uh, 8 a.m. Uh, yeah, we were a bit sad because we missed the flight due to uh, um, yeah the, the the very busy period at, uh, at Schiphol. Apparently there was a holiday, um, so. Um, yeah, we are really sad about that, but hopefully uh, um, we can still convey our enthusiasm about this technology to you uh, um, uh, via this online. Um, so uh, today I want to talk about our technology, of course, uh, but first of all, I would like to mention why we started Hulo. And um, basically what we would like to contribute to with this small piece of technology is to, uh, to battle water scarcity. And I think all over the world, water scarcity is becoming a, a bigger issue. Um, and we focus on the part of water scarcity that is because of the amount of uh, water leakages in distribution network. Um, and I think Italy is also uh, uh, really focusing about that. Uh, that's also one of the reasons that, of course, we joined uh, the WILL program besides all the learning effects. I think it's also really interesting to learn about the Italian market. And, it's really good, of course, that there's been uh, uh, funding become available uh, in Italy for this interesting topic. Um, and yeah, how to spend that money? Um, of course, we want to uh, reduce the water losses in the network and we want to get in control of that. So first of all, of course, we need to reduce the current water losses in the network. But secondly, I think what's even more important is that we stay in control of the water losses in the network. Um, and yeah, how do we do that? So I think there are multiple ways to get in control of your network, but we have to take into account that we have quite big networks with a certain amount of money. Um, we need, of course, to spend that money efficiently. Um, and we also have to take into account our personal availability, but also the satisfaction of those, uh, of those people. Um, so that's what I would like to ta uh, talk about as well. So how do we... Uh, come into control. So first of all, of course, we can start quite reactive and, and yeah, wait till a customer calls uh, and then try and find, fix the lead. We could have, of course, also uh, uh, apply a lot of repetitive leak detection. So doing leak detection uh, on a continuously basis by physical uh, methods. Um, but still then new leakages uh, will be detected quite late. Uh, and will be uh, be there for a long time. And that's where we want to focus on the real-time monitoring of leakages. And that sounds quite uh, uh, advanced maybe or, or high costly, um, but actually that's not the case. Um, and that's also what our idea is about. So it was also funded by Dutch uh, uh, water utilities like Fitens, for example, um, and it was based on a PhD research done within the Netherlands also uh, requested by the Dutch utilities. And first of all, I think what's important is, hey, how do we uh, uh, start monitoring our network? So where do we need sensors? Or if we have sensors, are they placed optimally? Um, so that's where we came in with the Hulo Observe module, where we can, let's say, automate the process of determining the optimal sensor positioning. And then if we have sensors, so we need pressure and flow sensors or flow sensors, um, yeah, how can we accurately detect those anomalies of which can be leakages without, let's say, false positive alarms so that people go to uh, a location without being a, being a leak. So that's where our uh, Hulo prophecy module uh, comes into place, uh, where we have developed a disruptive algorithm uh, based on AI um, to, uh, to detect leakages uh, more accurately than, uh, than ever. Um, this also uh, means that we, yeah, we are quite a plug and play solution. So we don't need historical data to train the model. Basically what we need is a very basic hydraulic model. So it doesn't need to be very accurate. It's just a steady state of the model. Um, and we need 
the, the current pressure and flow data, which all, um, most of the time is already enough to start with. Uh, and then if there are blind spots in the network, we can easily advise on where to place additional sensors with our observe module. Um, but yeah, why this uh, AI uh, uh, tool? Um, so I can understand that you, you would like to also know some more about, hey, what are the results by uh, using this technology? Um, and what's most important is that this technology can do with uh, a, a very few amount of sensors. So up till now, what we have validated with the Dutch water utilities, we can do with at least 50% fewer pressure and flow sensors in the network compared to, uh, to traditional uh, ways of monitoring. So for example, the night flow monitoring or demand forecasting. Uh, and moreover, uh, a big issue here in the Netherlands was the amount of false positive alarms. Uh, we reduce them with over 80% since we don't use historical data to predict uh, a future value of one sensor. We use the other sensors in the area to predict another sensor and vice versa. And now it sounds that we need a lot of sensors for that, but that's actually where our AI uh, comes into place. So basically we have a higher accuracy with fewer sensors um, and already the existing sensors that are in the network, for example, pressure regulation and, and some flow monitoring can be already used. Um, currently, we work with uh, uh, Dutch utilities and uh, uh, Wittefein and Bos as our uh, partner uh, in, in some international projects. So we are uh, planning to do a project in, uh, in Oman. Um, and also the research institutes, KWR and uh, Wetsis. Wetsis is the, the, the institute where the PhD research was done. Um, are closely uh, um, uh, following us, and we also discuss a lot of new innovations with them. Um, so, what are we looking for? We are really looking for uh, 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 pilots in Italy, since we really want to have that additional proof that it also works in networks uh, in Italy. Um, so, we are really looking for the right partners, the right uh, timing as well to do so. And um, also the trial reservoir, uh, could play a role in that uh, if uh, if the pilot should be a large scale pilot, for example. Um, that's it from my side. So thank you very much. And um, yeah, if you have any questions, uh, please let me know. Um, and hopefully next time um, our flights will uh, go a bit better. Well, I'm very impressed. Very multi-talented. Not only can you develop clever algorithms, but you also can take pictures of yourself driving the car and on the race to the end. So uh, terrific. Have we got any questions for Robert in the room? Not immediately. And let me let me kick up with a question. You, you you're asking that you're, you're interested in doing trials in Italy. What would what would a trial look like from your point of view? Yeah, a trial could look could could be uh, could be made up in different ways. But what we currently uh, uh, do uh, with some other utilities is that we basically ask for a historical data set of a certain area. Um, so it doesn't need to be a DMA; it can be a balance area, for example. And what we will then do is we will run our algorithms through that data set as is as if it was real time, and then they could compare the the leak detection time. Uh, with their uh, previous leak detection time, um, and that shows uh, how accurate um, and uh, and uh, how fast the uh, the model works. So uh, that's what what could be done. Uh, also, a larger scale pilot could be done uh, by really implementing the solution directly all over the network. Um, but since that's a bit more uh, um, cost intensive, um, yeah, we we rather than go via, for example, the trial reservoir. Um, so, yeah. Fantastic. Yeah, the, uh, the spoken yeah, about, about tests uh, already done. Uh, have they covered uh, a large, a large uh, mm -hmm. uh, area or how many kilometers of uh, miles uh, have they already covered uh, like a test? Can you hear that, Robert? Do you want me to repeat it? Not really. Could you repeat it? Uh, you spoke about some of the tests that you conducted. What sort of area have you uh, done those tests over? Was it a large area? Can you comment on the number of columns of pipe at all? Yeah, so um, I don't know the exact amount of kilometers of pipes in, uh, in, um, at uh, WML, for example. We did it uh, in 
three big villages um, so that are let's say a, a big balance area and for feed tents we are now doing it in the city of Leeuwarden so it's the northern city in the Netherlands where we are also uh, based with the company so that's uh, let's say city uh, city wide that's uh, the pilot area thank you any other questions at all? Are there any limitations to the type of sensor you might use? The type of sensors, the limited? No, there. Basically, we could use every pressure and flow sensor. Um, of course, I like the the story of Pydro as well. Uh, uh, yeah, which offers more sustainable solution. But basically, we could do with every type of sensor as long as it, as it gives a, a time series of pressure or flow data. Any other questions? Okay, wonderful. Brother, thank you very much for your time. That's terrific. Really enjoyed that. Let's uh, give one more round of applause, please. We'll move on to hear from Aaron, who's founded Tamea. Um, they build digital solutions uh, for the water sector. And um, Aaron, can you hear us okay? We can see you. I can, yes. Can you hear me okay? We can indeed. Please take it away. Very good. Hey, so we made it to uh, we made it to the last one here. So I hope everybody is um, I hope everybody's awake on this Friday afternoon. Um, I'm actually going to give you a little bit of of audience participation. So hopefully we can um, uh, make sure that everybody is awake. And I know that you're awake because the work of um, all of my awesome colleagues here is is so engaging. But um, my name is Aaron McGarvey. Um, I am uh, founder and CEO of Tomea. Um, Tomea provides digital solutions focused on utility operations. Uh, so I'm going to talk to you about uh, compliance today, but I'm going to talk about it from a, a completely different perspective, maybe than what you have, uh, what you have heard or, or what you're used to. Um, it's funny, Yusuf talked about American Water was his first customer, so I, I founded uh, Tomea based on my experience. Uh, with a failed digital transformation at American Water. Um, so he kind of, he I don't know if he's still here, but he kind of teed me up with American Water. So thanks, Yusuf. Um, but um, I, I want to start off with with that that experience at American Water. And, and one of the questions that I've, I worked on as a data scientist, uh, one of the questions that our leadership was interested in was, was frankly, um, why do we have so many NOVs uh, as a utility? Um, and that's part of their their business model um, was to uh, buy and acquire, look for water systems to acquire. Uh, and as part of that, obviously, water quality is extremely important. Um, so the the question that leadership had was was why do we have so many NOVs? Uh, and if you're not familiar with NOVs, NOV stands for Notice of Violation, uh, which is basically a water quality violation. Um, uh, it's at how that is is sort of talked about here in the U.S. is 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 an NOV. Um, so, uh, being a data scientist, I, I I started looking at the data and I came across this right, and I and I um, started looking at violations for for all the water systems here in the U.S. Um, in the U.S. we have something like fifty two thousand individual water systems. Some of them are very small. Um, but what I saw was this this uh, idea of monitoring came up, right? So um, I kept seeing monitoring over and over again, monitoring, routine monitoring major, routine monitoring minor. So what does that mean? Uh, if water water systems are getting violations for that, if they are out of compliance for monitoring, what does that mean? So I do want to ask for some audience participation a little bit. Uh, hopefully on Friday afternoon, that's not too much to ask. So here's what we're going to do. All right. On the next slide is a set of sampling requirements for a water system. And to illustrate this concept, I'm going to give you 10 seconds to look at this uh, table, look at these requirements and try and figure out, uh, put yourself in the shoes of a water quality supervisor and try and figure out everything that you need to sample for by the end of April. 
All right, so 10 seconds to figure out everything you need to sample for. Oh, and by the way, if you miss even a single one, if you miss even a single sample, you're fired. All right, all right. So that's the game that we're going to play, and I'm going to give you 10 seconds, and the 10 seconds starts now. All right. So there's over a thousand samples required for this water system just by the end of the month. All right. Uh, and if you miss, if you're a water quality supervisor here in the US and you miss even a single one, um, that is a monitoring violation. So hopefully that explains what monitoring means and it explains really the role of a water quality supervisor and what they're responsible for, right? So almost two thirds of, of water quality violations here in the US are not actually due to water quality, they're due to monitoring. Um, so um, what I wanna introduce um, is the idea of compliance validation um compliance validation is extremely simple um it's the kind of thing that you might ask yourself why this doesn't already exist um and if you're asking yourself why doesn't this already exist why don't water utilities already do this you're on the right track right so all compliance validation does is say what are all your sampling requirements for each sampling requirement have i done it have I done it, number one? And number two, have the results been properly communicated and processed by my regulator? So to give you an example, in this case, we've got 30, a requirement for 30 lead and copper samples from June, uh, and this is American date format. So June 1st, 2025 through September 30th, 2025, 30 samples have to be taken during that period. The question is very simple. When that time comes around, have I done it? Have I taken all 30? Have they been sent to the lab, processed? Uh, have they been reported to my regulatory agency? Yes or no, all right? So what I've just described to you is uh, Sample Watch. Uh, Sample Watch is an application that takes all your drinking water sampling requirements, puts them in one place. Uh, it provides programmatic compliance validation. Uh, and it, it puts all of your sampling results in one place as well. So it, it does one thing very simply and one thing only, and it tells you um, for a given requirement, have I met the result? Uh, how does it work? Uh, well, here in the US, uh, there's publicly available data for, for system sampling requirements. Uh, so it takes that publicly available data, it combines that across uh, roughly 20,000 different water systems to create a single source of truth tracks sampling requirements in real time as they are met. Um, it's no good knowing about that you missed a sample if the deadline has already passed, right? Um, so um, it tracks those requirements as they are met and it notifies you of any missing results. It's not pretty yet, but this is the application and you can see it's very simple to use. If there is a green check mark, if you've done it, and if you haven't, there's a red X and it's as simple as that and it gives you a URL to the regulatory agency to provide that proof uh, documentation in case of an audit, uh, in case the agency says, can you please prove to me that you've taken the sample and you've taken it at the appropriate time, the appropriate place, and that you've reported to, it, to us on time, All right? Uh, so some people may be familiar with Horizon Limbs. This software tries, goes where Limbs doesn't go. Limbs does not know your requirements does not provide any validation of compliance. Um, you know, what are the potential benefits? Well, as I've already stated, two thirds of water quality violations in the US are due to monitoring. <laughs> so um, you're talking about a lot of low hanging fruit and easy ways to reduce violations, potentially by as many as, as two thirds. Um, and you're taking a, a highly manual process, a process that's performed on spreadsheets um, and you're automating it. Um, so you're, you, you're gonna see an OPEX reduction, All right? So 
Um, I want to just say, you know, the, the single most important thing that the folks who are there in the room can do um, is really say, you know, is this a problem for you? Uh, I know it's a problem here in the U.S. It's a huge problem here in the U.S. It's a problem for you uh, wherever you are in Europe. Um, please send me an email. Um, and uh, that's it. So thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Aaron. Uh, yeah, please do help them out. Please do send him an email to say yes or no, that it is a problem or it isn't a problem for you. Are there any immediate questions for Aaron at all? Aaron, you didn't speak much about the, the price of your solution. Are you able to comment on that yet? Yeah, so um, it's very low. <laughs> um, because, and, and and this is a SaaS. This is a SaaS product. It's pure software. Um, and my, as a result, um, I'm I'm able to offer this this product, uh, particularly to to small utilities here in the U.S. who are extremely budget conscious, um, and, and for for very, I'll say, um, under a hundred dollars a month. Super, thank you. And I know, I know you're um, you're a very, a very inventive guy. Um, do you have other solutions that you're you're working on that you can tease while we have you online? <laughs> um, so I do the the other piece to my business. I, I do do data science consulting for uh, for other startups in the industry. Um, so I'm you know I I'm involved in in different ways with other startups. Um, but yes, of course I you know I have a grand scheme of to uh to offer products for very cheap uh SaaS products to utilities for very cheap um across all different problems that utilities face so super thank you any other questions for Aaron or Kevin? No. okay wonderful thank you very much for your time let's see you on the final round of applause Wonderful. That, that wraps up all the presentations from our startup. So I hope that has given you a really nice survey, as I said at the start, of the innovation that's coming through the pipeline that's going to hit the water sector um, as we approach it. We're going to go into a slightly different rhythm now and um, just discuss what's going on in the sector at the moment, what Will's role is in contributing to what's going on in the sector. Um, but please, as the screen says, use this time if you haven't already to get your votes in for the startups that you've heard pitched to us today, please um, uh, just take a moment to go on to Menti. You'll see their logos there of the last five companies that presented, and you can vote on who you think is the most promising. I said at the, uh, at the beginning, there will be a very exciting prize for whoever wins um, your vote. Uh, but for now, I will hand over to Gabriella, who's going to take us through um, our conversation for the remaining 20 minutes or so. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, now we will have a short panel just uh, discuss about with the companies and the, the, everybody who makes this process and biggest experience uh, a reality. So I ask to all the people you see on the screen to come here on, uh, on our uh, have a seat here. So we will try to have a short discussion. So the, the purpose of short, this discussion is uh, First, to give you the possibility to see the, the vote online. There is also the, the pink chair. Nobody wants the pink chair. I, I can understand. Nobody <laughs> wants. How much you want? Oh, it's the here. Oh, it's the here. So, uh, you see, I don't make the presentation because you see everybody on the screen. So, we have uh, first to Say big thank you. Uh, the microphone is there. Oh. So, so here we have uh, the representation of the company that made possible the the atom, and uh, also with uh, me representing the CSP. Um, first question comes from the my point of view. I would love to uh, Professor Bertanza from University. So uh, starting with. Uh, 